Check one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hey, Matthew, it's Craig. So I did the countdown. Is that okay? Oh, perfect. Good afternoon. Would members of the Planning and Growth Management Committee please report to Committee Room 1 for quorum?
Okay, so I have to call the meeting back to order if I can. Can I get some order in the room? To my colleagues that are having discussions, Councillor Matt Lowe and others. Limited time election today, got to get going, unless people don't want to vote. And I think most people have opinions. Okay. So, I am down to John Bossens. Is John Bossens here? Uh, yes, sir. I am listed twice. Uh, so, I would prefer to speak uh, with Jeff Jekyll at the second listing. Thank you. That's one less speaker on my list because they're there twice. I have Mike Dror from Bousfields, and I have Andy Gort and John Kaiser. Is Mike Dror here? Mike, Mike, calling once, calling twice. Don't see any mic right now. Andy Gort. Yep. Andy Gort. After that, John Kaiser. And after that, Arif Daramashi. So, Mr. Gort, five minutes. We're here to hear from you. If you can be less, we appreciate it. But you do have five minutes. You're entitled to it. And if there are questions, we will come back to you with those. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, uh, Chair uh, David Shiner and members of the committee. Um, my name is Andy Gort and I'm the president of, of SARA, South Eglinton Residents Association. Um, we, uh, we encompass our whole area, it's inside the Midtown in Focus area and we are encompassing the largest part of that area geographically. We represent, uh, we have quite a variety of uh, developments in our area from several apartment neighborhoods, Davisville and Sudan neighborhood, uh, some very high density mixed uh, use areas like Young and Eglinton, and then uh, a number of uh, traditional village street, we call that Young, uh, Mount Pleasant and uh, Bayview. And we have a very good representation, including from uh, the condo community and the tenant community. Um, we, um, um, my notes here. Um, so uh, we have um, we spent a tremendous amount of time in the last uh, two and a half years uh, getting involvement in this plan. We've poured our hearts and souls in, into it. And we've also kept a very active participation in all the developments that have occurred over the last couple of years. Uh, we are at every community consultation meeting. We try to get uh, groups of neighborhoods together, uh, residents together. We are at the OMB as participants. We have appeared as party. We have hired our own lawyers. So. Uh, we've got, uh, over the years, uh, getting quite a bit of experience with the OMB. Our approach has been um, that uh, very pragmatic. Uh, instead of saying no development, we accept that change is coming to our area uh, and that um, there are uh, significant housing needs in the city. Uh, we do like to also make sure that our own residents, the current residents, also get looked after. We know there is a lot of provincial uh, uh, policy legislation that affects uh, how municipalities what they can and cannot do, and of course the OMB and LPAT. And unfortunately, the Young Eglinton plan as it is today is extremely weak and uh, has not been much support for any of the defenses at, at the OMB. Um, we are increasingly alarmed at uh, the amount of accumulated uh, development in our area, uh, not just in the Sarah area, but in the overall area, because we really do uh, go back and forth. It, it really is one community. Um, and um, so when we talk about uh, whether one street is affected more than another street, uh, for instance, uh, the area from Eglinton, Sudan along uh, uh, Young Street has five large uh, developments, 25 uh, 100 units, probably 4,000 people all emptying on, or mostly emptying on a, on a little narrow lane called Cowbell Lane, uh, creating a tremendous congestion in that area too. I think we're seeing congestion everywhere in, in our area. Uh, what we're really uh, even more concerned about is that as development progresses, we are not seeing any progress on what we call the elements of a complete community. So whether it is schools, uh, what is happening to transit availability on the Young Line, uh, what is happening to parks, what's happening to employment. Uh, so that is a, a major concern of, of, of ours. Um, so what we, uh, what we see is um, we've got enough experience now to know that unless we get a plan in place that is legally enforceable, uh, we will continue to see more and more applications coming in. Uh, we know where the developers are uh, buying properties. 
Uh, so it's very critical for us that we see a plan coming in place, and especially this particular plan that's so broad-based and incorporates all these elements of a complete community. Uh, we feel that um, we, we have kind of kept track of all the developments. So we already know, having tallied up from records from the city, that we're looking at 21,000 new units in the Young Eglinton area, 35,000 people, and we've calculated based on transit uh, uh, um, factors that we're looking at 7,900 new transit riders in the Young and Eglinton area alone, and that will swamp the young, the young line uh, as, we, as we see it. Uh, development is occurring much faster and much larger than we anticipated, so we think that those 35,000 people will be there by 2028. Uh, so it's very, very close. And our opinion is that uh, with the appropriate amendments that this plan should be accepted and that we then can finally start to have a plan of record and can start to focus on all the missing elements of a complete community and start to spend time on that as opposed to constantly listening to more developments in the area. Thank you. There are questions from Councillor Robinson, then from Councillor Matlow. So I promised I'd ask you a question. Hey, I can't okay. see you, but you can hopefully hear me. So you're aware we far exceeded the, gross, uh, the growth plan's minimum growth targets for Young Eglinton. You're very aware of that. Um, and the final population of this area could be, as, a, as the chair has said earlier, in the, in the 120 plus. But much sooner. Right. 2051 or something like that. Right. So um, you, you really represent the area south of Eglinton. Right. And when I look at your map, I think eh, that a lot of that makes sense. Maybe a couple of those buildings could be reduced in height, but generally it's not the worst plan. But when you look in the northeast quadrant of Young and Eglinton, my question to you would be, would you support some of those building heights coming down? And do you feel some of them are excessively high? Uh, I think we've, we've already indicated to you that if there's amendments coming forth uh, about lower heights um, uh, in your area or in our area around the Eglinton School specifically, we definitely would support that as long as that means that the plan gets approved and gets passed because uh, if not, then I think all is for naught and those developers will come in anyway uh, the way I know developers. Um, uh, so. I think that's the, the answer is yes, we definitely would love a reduction, but as long as the plan gets passed. So I'm speaking of Eglinton, Roehampton, and Broadway specifically, you would support those building heights being reduced? Uh, yeah, as I would like to see a reduction around the Eglinton School because they are looking at the same kind of situation as John Fisher. Yes. Um, but I, I, want to, I would like to make sure, propose that it does not stop the plan and we don't run out of runway by uh, council disbanding for municipal elections in the fall. And what about Young Street feeling a, like a main street, you know, having that feel and not shadowing the, the neighborhood to the northeast quadrant, uh, some of the heights along Young Street, would you also support those coming down? Well, if I, if I look at what is in, the, in those maps from 2111 to 2116, yes, 70% uh, is already basically done. Done in terms of either approved or under review at the OMB. In my area, I got eight OMB appeals still on the go. So um, if, if there are things we can do to mitigate further uh, shadows, but I think we're already looking at a lot of damage that, that has been done yeah, from a shadow point yeah, of view. In play because of the Wild West. I'm specifically referencing map 21-2, 21, 12, yep. 21 12. So right. that's the areas where there actually are quite a few dark purple squares, right. from, which is the areas that staff are putting numbers on. So right. we want to make sure people have input on that. and and then proceed accordingly with possibly reducing those. If, if you can uh, bring forward amendments, then we would, we would be great as Support long as them. they pass the policy, the provincial policies, and if they pass on a timely basis to make sure that a plan gets enacted and we don't get stuck without a plan because we've lived with that for three years and we know what happens. Well, longer than three years, but thank you very much for your answers. Matlo. Andy, um, we are, um, we're working on a way without 
without um, threatening the integrity of uh, the Midtown and Focus plan itself. In other words, to protect, we want to protect the, the good stuff, but to try to lower the heights. Um, would you, would you and Sarah support uh, if we, uh, if our goal is to have it approved uh, before council has its break, to uh, take a pause until next month and go back to the community and have a community meeting and address the question regarding heights and then work with staff and work in, and as, as a council to both support the improved infrastructure and social services, but ensure in areas like part of the community that I represent, from north of Eglinton to Roehampton and Broadway, that there is a, an emphasis on, on green space, on parks, on lowered heights, on, on and, and, and of course that would then have uh, um, a cumulative effect on the community because of course any part of the community that has excessive growth then impacts the entire community with respect to the current dearth of surfaces and infrastructure. So there's got to be a question in all this would you, somewhere. Would you, would, you, would you support us having that opportunity to go to the community and do that over the next month? Okay, we've been at this for two and a half years. Uh, we have continually asked for all the things that you're su suggesting to us. Mm -hmm. uh, I, we already have publicly stated to both of you that we'd be happy to see a, a less intense and uh, richer plan from a, a community services from a park's point of view. So uh, I think uh, that's obvious that we would support that. Thank you. Uh, if that answers your question. Thank yeah, you. I just want to make sure you. that it moves along and we don't yeah. get caught in a political... It won't stop it from moving along. It should just move it along in a better way. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Any other questions of the deputant? Not seeing any. Thank you very much for Great. coming today. So then I have John Kaiser. Mr. Kaiser. After that, Arif Dharamshi. Pardon me? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm John Kaiser. In order to avoid repetition, I would ask that perhaps you consider allowing Dr. Reef Dharamshi, who is okay. seated beside me, to speak first. Sure. Are you guys going to try and do it in less than 10 minutes for the yes, two? Yes, we are. That's terrific. We won't stop you, but if you can, it's fine. In order to, to minimize the amount of duplication, if I go first, no problem. Assists. Thank you. Councillors, members of the PGMC, I am Dr. Arif Duramshi, a duly qualified medical practitioner, graduated from the University of Toronto, and, have, and, have, and have having had the privilege of serving the residents of Toronto as an ER physician for 30 years. My deputation is in addition to and in support of our written submission from Overland LLP and the deputation and submission of Mr. John Kaiser representing our South neighbour, the Society of United Professionals. With a group of other physicians, we are the owners and operators of several independent medical facilities in the GTA and the beneficial owners of 2245 Young Street, the second building from the southeast corner of the Young Eglinton intersection and immediately adjacent to the Young Eglinton Crosstown subway entrance. Many will recognize the Tim Hortons. I am before you to seek deferral of the Young Eglinton secondary plan for the reasons which I will now detail. For the Young Eglinton Secondary Plan area, city planning staff have projected 94,000 residents in the pipeline for 2031, that is 13 years from now, and 127,000 plus for the proposed plan area by 2051. Furthermore, city staff has also informed us at the statutory open house on May 28 that there has been no net new jobs in the plan area since 1991. In the vision statement and goal throughout the plan, it speaks to the city and provincial policies for the preservation and encouragement of employment uses, particularly in the Young Eglinton Crossroads, a dual, traffic, a dual transit node. The specific policies referenced are detailed in our solicitor's submission from Overland LLP. The plan in its current form runs counter to these employment policies. There are no designated employment lands and no provisions for encouraging and prioritizing new employment developments. There have been over 60 applicants, applications in the last decade, and to the best of my knowledge, no new large employment use applications. This speaks volumes. Young and Egg is increasingly becoming all live and no work. In our experience, the plan discourages high quality employment uses. The Society of United Professionals is an organization that represents 8,400 professionals that operate our electricity power generation facilities. They're the owner of 2239 Young Street and our south neighbors. They wish to expand their head office and bring high quality employment. 
we at Gensal would like to build a medical complex with 30 to 40 physicians providing much needed medical urgent care, diagnostic imaging, laboratory services alongside primary and specialized medical care. We've come together and proposed to build a 100,000 square foot, 14 story building right at the subway entrance, creating three to 400 jobs at an investment of 25 to 30 million dollars. Our consultants, Nira Architects, Bousfield, and WSP Engineering have endorsed a favorable opinion of our completed proposal for a purpose-built building at a strategic location providing employment and health care to the nearly 127,000 people projected for the proposed plan area. Our plan is within the current as of right 61 meter zoning, which would permit approximately 17 stories. However, the preoccupation of the Young Eglinton Secondary Plan with tall building residential condos is working against these policies, fostering a live-work balance. In this plan, our lands at the Young Eglinton Crossroads are deemed for a mere eight stories to accommodate two, two tall building condos on each side. In fact, the north proposal at 1 Eglinton Avenue East, a 65-story condo, is a mere 6.8 metres from our lot line in defiance of the tall building guidelines. Consider the consequences of this error. It makes no economic sense to demolish a five-story office building to only build an eight-story building. Where does this leave the two-story dilapidated Tim Hortons? A lost orphan site, the side of which will jut into the beautiful corner plaza space obstructing pedestrian flow. A consequence of piecemeal planning. How can this be called good planning? If not a viable office medical building, then what, then what does city staff plan for this prominent orphan site? Jensel and the Society of United Professionals have been active participants in the process from the beginning of Midtown in Focus. Our multiple requests for constructive dialogue, whether written, deputation, or email, did not yield a meeting with planning staff. At the landowner and developers meeting on May 8th, attended by over 30 landowners, there, were only 10, there was only 10 minutes of group dialogue after the disclosure of the Heights map. Only now do we have a pre-application meeting on June 19th. We understand the demands of planning staff from a project of this magnitude importance. We feel the process is being rushed before council rises. Accordingly, we request deferral of the plan for adequate constructive dialogue and comprehensive planning. Councillors and members of PGMC, we see our proposal as part of the solution to many of the goals raised in the Young Eglinton Secondary Plan. Will you support our request for deferral in order that our proposal receives due process and due consideration? Respectfully submitted, Arif Duramshi, MD. Mr. Kaiser. So you wish to continue and then we can do questions comprehensively? Uh, certainly, we, we, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, my name is John Kaiser. I'm a partner with the firm of Kaiser Mason Ball. We are the solicitors for the owners of uh, 2239 Young Street and we call them the uh, Society of Union Professionals. This is the head office for our client company and it, it lies uh, w one building uh, south of Dr. Duramchi's uh, Gensel Properties at 2245 Young Street. We've joined together with Gensel Properties for the purpose of making these representations and working together to make it very clear to you how essential it is to preserve the employment opportunities in this area. I was really pleased to hear the tremendous response, I thought, from your committee with respect to the Unilever application and the prospect of providing enormous amount of employment in that particular portion of the City of Toronto. Right now, we're told that since 1991, there has been zero increase in terms of employment opportunities in the Young Eglinton Centre. This is the crossroads. This is the a world-class center that must be given far better opportunities in order to make and sponsor work and live in the area. We know that there are some gorgeous buildings being built and we hope that the owners of these buildings and the people who live there will be giantly successful. But what we're asking you to do today is to say time out, pause for a moment. The loaf is only halfway baked. We must have a very clear statement from you, sirs and ladies, to the effect that employment must be sponsored, it must be fostered in this area. Very clearly, in the second paragraph of the description in Amendment 405, you clearly made a statement. This is to be an employment area, offices and all of the other disciplines that are necessary to attract and to provide work. It's a wonderful area. It's 
of course, got the best transportation system that Toronto can offer, that Canada is able to offer, and yet we're finding that as we look at the schedules to this work, there is a provision for 65 stories on the adjoining property to the north, 58 stories to the south, and eight for our client's property. That's less than what's permitted now by the zoning bylaw. It doesn't make any sense. It really leaves us flat. And what we're here to say is, we want your staff to be instructive, because your staff is wonderful. There is no question that they're patient, but they do receive their direction from you, the members of council. You've got to say to them here and now, make it more clear that these people who will provide employment are given the opportunity to do so. That's what we're asking you to do. We're asking you to defer the studies related to this to make certain that you have a very clear statement with respect to employment opportunities in this corridor. That's what we're here about this afternoon. Thank you very much for your Thank patience. you. Are there questions of the deputant? Councillor Campbell. Sorry, so you're, uh, you're on the east side of Young, just south of Eglinton. Yes. Correct. Correct. 65 to the north, 58 to the south, and you're eight. Correct. That's Got it. Right. Okay. John. Thank you for your questions. We, uh, so, so we appreciate your giving us the time. We, we, we know it, how badly that people have worked to get it to this stage. We're just simply saying that don't leave us out. Uh, your, your package has two strong letters from each the, for the, uh, the Overland firm that represents Dr. Duramshi and his brothers and our own firm, whom I announced earlier. We've given you the detail. I'm not going to waste your time with that sort of thing. Because I know you're very thoughtful. I know you want to do the right Mr. thing. Mr. Kaiser, what you would like to do is to see if there is some way for this plan to encourage in more employment and give you some benefit of that upon the site, which both of you collectively own or represent. Is that yes, it? Mr. Shiner. Yes, sir. And that's what you would like. And you're saying that the plan currently sandwiches you in the middle with a very little building and doesn't give you the ability to do that in a financially uh, responsible way. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any of the questions. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay. So we have David Tang, then Chris Spoke, and then Clive Raymond. Is Mr. Tang here? Well, Mr. Tang, you have five minutes. We're here to listen to you. If you do it in less, that's great. I can, I can try and do it in less than five. Thank you. But you have five minutes. We will not cut you off. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to the members of the committee. Thank you for, uh, for, for um, considering this plan. Uh, and I wa do want to thank on behalf, my name is David Tang. I'm a lawyer at Miller Thompson. I act for the uh, Girl Guides of Canada, which own the property at 50 Merton. I want to thank staff actually for having heard and having responded to the concerns we did have and we expressed in the, uh, the, the initial consultations. Uh, the approach of um, considering the possibility of compiling and uh, putting together properties is, is a very helpful and, and a useful step forward in, in, in this plan. We really only have one additional last issue to talk about, and that really deals with the new introduction in the last revision to MAP 2110 uh, of the uh, potential cultural heritage value mapping. This uh, property, 50 Merton, build, uh, 50 Merton Street, uh, is identified as a property with, quote, potential cultural heritage value. It is, however, a building that effectively is a rather, quite frankly, nondescript 1960s uh, aging building uh, that will need to be replaced. Uh, and the problem here is uh, it's, it's actually too small for, for, the, uh, for the Girl Guide's current operations. This uh, particular mapping probably puts more difficulties in the place of its uh, redevelopment than anything else. They will probably have to do this with the developer. Uh, and this simply establishes a, an additional um, barrier to the process. And so we're simply asking that the map be amended to delete the, uh, the 50 Merton Street site as a potential cultural heritage value, 
I think the building uh, is clearly going to be uh, redeveloped at some point, and th this is an unnecessary uh, barrier. So those are, those are all my uh, comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions of the deputant? Not seeing any, thank you for coming today. Chris spoke. After Chris is Clay, Clive Ryman and then Charles Arbez. Good afternoon. Five minutes, I've got the clock running. You can see it, Chris. Sure. Uh, my name is Chris Spoke and I'm a member of Housing Matters. Uh, so we are a group of Torontonians who advocate for increased housing supply to address the housing availability and affordability crisis that is pricing many renters, young people, and middle-class families out of our city. I appreciate being granted the opportunity today to comment once again on the Midtown and Focus official plan amendment and would like to start by thanking planning staff for the diligent work that went into its preparation. There's a lot to like within its 78 pages. Midtown is certainly one part of Toronto where we have not shied away from much needed intensification and we believe that the city is all the better for it. That said, we would like to highlight one item in particular that we believe would have a particularly adverse effect on housing availability and affordability in Midtown. Section 7.1 of the proposed secondary plan outlines new minimum unit size requirements that are above and beyond those required by the building code. Specifically, two bedroom units would require a minimum of 87 square meters of gross floor area and three bedroom units would require a minimum of 100 square meters of gross floor area. So to put that in some context, when looking at three recent projects under construction in Midtown, we see that the average size for two bedroom units being built now is about 63 square meters and the average size of three bedroom units is about 96 square meters. To make this a little more concrete, the average two bedroom unit that we're currently seeing built in Midtown is about 28% smaller than the required minimum size set out in Midtown and Focus. Larger unit sizes considered on their own are desirable and contribute to a better quality of life for their residents, but of course they cannot be considered on their own. We believe that it is vitally important that we think through some of the second order effects of these new requirements. Toronto is the fifth most expensive city in the world when measured as a ratio of housing prices to incomes, according to data compiled just this week by Bloomberg. More expensive even on that basis than New York City. Requiring by law that new units be built to be significantly larger than they currently are would have the effect of first, reducing the total number of new units delivered to the market, both by reducing the number that can fit within a given project and by rendering some projects uneconomic at the margin, and second, uh, by uh, of exacerbating our affordability crisis, both through the straightforward logic that larger units are more expensive and through the adverse impact on uh, housing supply overall. That said, we request that Midtown and Focus be amended to not include these new minimum unit size requirements and to instead first take some time to monitor the impact that similar requirements that have been included in TO Core, the downtown plan, have on housing availability and affordability before extending them to Midtown. Thank you. Thank you. Questions of you, Councillor Matlow. Is your position that uh, we should just every development should just be approved as big and high as possible? No. So, because that, that's what it always comes across as. Could you clarify that? Sure. Um, our position as it relates to my deputation is that the new minimum uh, unit size requirements will lead to fewer units in the given allowed heights and, and floor plates of, of the buildings per the, uh, the uh, Midtown and Focus Plan. That's true. Is, do you, why do you, I mean, are you submitting that, that affordability is solely to do with supply? Uh, we believe that increasing the supply of housing places downward pressure on prices uh, and, and going with kind of best, basic economics. Even a luxury condo that's built, is that, how, is that, how is that helping affordability in the city? Sure. Uh, when we build luxury condos, let's say in Midtown in particular, we create space for uh, empty nesters to empty their homes. Uh, there's a downstream effect known as filtering by housing economists where you get to move out of a lower end unit to a higher end unit and there's these downstream effects that open up more units for new residents. So are you submitting that we, that we don't further restrict the heightened density of development in an area that has already reached so many of its uh, uh, targets under the growth plan? Where, where, where kids can't go to a local school, where nobody can get onto the subway in the morning, where there's water, you know, sewer capacity issues? Are you suggesting we don't put any restrictions on the, on the heightened densities? I'm not suggesting that, no. I'm suggesting that we do not include new minimum unit sizes above and beyond those required by the building code. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? 
Not seeing any. Thank you very much. Chris and Clive Raymond. I'm a boss. Thank you. Pardon me? Uh, I won't speak right now. Thank you. Are you. If you're going to speak, this is the time. No, I'm not. Okay. I just want to be sure, Mr. Raymond. You're okay not speaking. Okay. Charles Arbez. And after Mr. Arbez is John Bossens and Mr. Kettle. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Charles Arbez. I am a development manager at Hallmark Developments. I'm here before you today to speak to this item to express, again, our concern with the policies proposed to be brought forward as part of the Midtown and Focus Plan, an official plan amendment, and also to highlight some of the issues that we had going forward during the consultation process recently over the last six months. Uh, this is specifically regarding a property at 13, uh, rather, 313 Eglinton Avenue West, which is at the southwest corner of Eglinton and Avenue Road and is directly across the street from the currently under construction Avenue LRT station, part of the overall Eglinton Crosstown project. To give you some background on the site, uh, it was currently purchased around seven years ago with a long-term development plan in mind. And while there is no active application currently on file, the site's location on one of the, on, on one of the city's most prominent mixed-use intersections within the city of Toronto would warrant a high-quality redevelopment of the property coupled with the aforementioned Eglinton Crosstown project as well as the close proximity of the Avenue LRT station across the street I mentioned earlier. In order to facilitate a healthy dialogue with city staff, we were actually um, involved earlier in the process uh, over the last five to six months, which started with a, with a meeting facilitated by BUILD with Councillor Shiner and the capacity of chair of this committee um, and other key staff members after the Heritage Batch listings were released in August of 2017 uh, regarding the Midtown area. Following this, we provided written comments to the city via a letter um, on February 22nd of 2018 regarding the proposed policies, which again outlined our concerns, which I'll get into later on, um, which again highlighted the mismatch between the significant investment in higher order transit directly across the street, as well as the restrictive built form limits encumbering the subject site through the official plan amendment. We subsequently requested a one-on-one -on -one meeting to discuss our concerns and refused due to the level of interest in the plan and were told that a group consul uh, consultation meeting would instead be held to update everyone on forthcoming modifications to the plan. We attended this meeting on May 8th, during which time we could not express our concerns given that the proposed policy was not available at that time. Although after the release of the plan following May 8th, um, on May 18th, which was made available to the general public as well as review of this committee today, um, the chance for further consultation in our view being lost from, by, um, through city staff. We still studied what the policies meant for this site in conjunction with the Heritage Batch listing earlier in August of 2017. And we actually had a uh, massing study that was drafted up by our planning consultants for both a non-residential and residential redevelopment of the site, retaining the existing building on site of the two-story that exists currently. And in essence, what it showed us was in draft form that um, the policies combined with the batch listing and the policies themselves, to be perfectly honest, would completely sterilize the site from a development perspective, um, resulting in a very, very inefficient building design that would eliminate any sort of potential redevelopment possibilities on the site. Further, with the, impl with the implementation of this, uh, of this proposed official plan amendment being enacted pursuant to Section 26 of the Planning Act in and in regards to the site's location within a major transit station area as per the growth plan, it would be impossible to appeal any such approval to the local planning appeal tribunal, which ought to have facilitated a far more detailed and inclusive consultation process than what we unfortunately had, re had to receive up until this point. Again, while the site's location and surrounding area would warrant a high quality and sensitively designed redevelopment, the proposed policies put forth as part of the Midtown and Focus plan hinder the much needed redevelopment potential of this key intersection, and again, effectively sterilize the site from a development uh, perspective. As such, we would, we would respectfully request that the adoption of this item be deferred to a later date, at least as it applies to the property at, at 313 Eglinton Avenue West, in order to attempt to continue a cooperative dialogue with city planning staff regarding the importance of this prominent intersection um, and the adjacency of the, of the nearby Eglinton LRT. Thank you, and I will accept any questions. Councillor Matlow has questions of you. Given the... Uh Given the fact that our planning staff have held dozens of community meetings, uh, open houses, uh, pop-up 
uh, events at uh, the subway stations and farmers markets, meetings directly uh, at various uh, condos and apartments and et cetera, and, have, uh, and, and these meetings have been widely advertised throughout the community in a variety of ways. Why, why, why do you submit that, there's, that there hasn't been enough consultation? Um, I should have been more clear. What we were requesting was a one-on-one -on -one cult uh, one -on -one. consultation with city planning staff. We understand that there is a lot of interest in this area and in the official plan amendment, but in our view, uh, more time should have been taken to consult directly with landowners such as this, especially with a property that's so prominent at a key intersection in the area. May, may I ask you uh, one, one last question? Um, would you acknowledge that that the city does have a right to review and update its plans, and our heritage preservation staff have a right to identify where there is, whether it be cultural or architectural heritage sites, and that just because somebody has speculated on a site doesn't mean that they already have some assumption of an approval to do something, and that, you know, the landscape can change around you. For sure. Um we believe that, you know, in addition to taking into account approvals that are, so to speak, in the pipeline, these policies should also take into account um, special sites, in, in, in our opinion, such as this, that are on key intersections at prominent corners. And it was just our request to meet with city planning staff one-on-one -on -one to discuss these issues. And unfortunately, that was a request that was time and time again I agree. refused. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. So on your site, that's the corner building. At the southwest corner. Southwest corner. Correct. Do you own any property adjacent to it? No. In your perspective, does the plan allow you to acquire property adjacent to it and set back <coughs> reasonable density in that area if you were able to do so and still save the heritage building? I mean, that, that's always something that we would consider as part, of, as part of the process going forward into these sorts of things. But again, that would be detail that we would, be like, that we would have liked to discuss with staff in the meetings that were requested. Well, I, I understand that, but their proposal is now in the public and has been for since the agenda came out. It shows the heights that they'd like to see in the area. It details the area that can be redeveloped. You know what your site is. So my simple question is, have you taken the time to look how you could assemble further properties in the area near you? And if you worked with them, still be able to work with the heritage aspect of the building and come up with a reasonable or what you perceive to be a reasonable development. Sure. If you can answer the question, that's great. I'm, I'm trying to gather some knowledge from you. Yeah, no, we have neighbors to the west um, that have long-term um, leases in place. It's uh, an LCBO as well as a bank and um, I think that's about it. LCBO and the bank, they have long-term leases in place. We've talked to them in a neighborly way. Um, that would be the only opportunity to assemble. Uh, unfortunately, to the south of us is a stable residential neighborhood, and it wraps around Avenue and Eglinton. So if anything, if there was an opportunity is, you know, if the city wanted to plan that intersection, in, intersection in a more comprehensive way, they might have considered wrapping around a mixed-use designation along Avenue a little bit further in order to allow for a little more room on this intersection. So we have thought about it, but given the current policies and the fact that you can't encroach into stable uh, residential neighborhoods, we, we didn't entertain that. So in other words, your site is difficult to work with because you can't assemble with your neighbor's site because of commitments they have on that. To the and that's the reason why you're asking, can we look at something else? And we're in conflict with you mm -hmm. because we want to, we have at least listed that building mm -hmm. and don't really want to see it come down for a Correct. modern building. Yeah. Correct. Do you really think that there's a resolution to that? Well, if if anything, I mean that we that sorry that we can do because we plan comprehensively, mm -hmm. and we can't necessarily plan based on who's got a lease on what property. Mm -hmm. We have to plan on what's best in the area and what buildings should be saved. Yeah. What we are saying is, is combined with the batch listing and the restrictive angular planes from the stable residential designations to the south is resulted in a very inefficient building. We just keep it as is, um, but is that the highest and best use across from a station? We, we just really wanted to have those fulsome 
discussions with, with staff. And again, we don't have an active development application. These are plans that we're planning for 15 years from now. Um, um, and I just believe that sometimes people with active development applications get um, immediate attention. Um, but <laughs> I just, yeah. Okay. Just raising a few I, issues, I, I but understand. we have considered that. I understand what you're asking. I don't know how much we could actually do because deferring it for uh, a month or six months, I don't think would resolve that issue. I think it's the discussions that you still have to have with staff about that area because they can, along the line in the near or mid term, still recommend changes there with you. But I don't, and if you really think that a deferral for a month or three months would make a difference, can you tell me why we would have something different except for a disagreement? We were just told that we would be able to work with these policies for a redevelopment, potential redevelopment, and we, we masked it over the past few weeks after the last version was released, okay. and what we're saying is it just doesn't work. Okay. I appreciate you coming forward, and I think it's appropriate that you ex express those concerns to us, so thank you for coming. Thank you. So I have next John Bossens and Jeff Kettle. And then I have Glenn Robinson. Do I have a tag team again? You do. We are presenting together. Are you presenting together? Are you, are you going to go one after the other? Yes. Or is your presentation generally joint in nature? Uh, one after the other and then joint questions. Okay. And you're going to try and keep it within the 10 minutes or better? Uh, better. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Councillor Shine, uh, members of the Planning Growth Committee. Um, we're here today. Um, I'm uh, Jeff Cattell, co-chair uh, co of the Federated North Toronto Residents Association, and John Bossons is uh, an executive member of the uh, of FONTRA. Uh, the, uh, so, first of all, some context here, and it's already been said, but this is the first comprehensive plan for this area, for this very large um, area um, of, of intense, one of the original five growth centers of the, of the city by the province. Um, since the um, establishment of the amalgamated Toronto government in 1998, and it will replace official plan provisions last updated in 2002. So frankly, as such, it's, it's long overdue. Um, and um, so we, we generally support the plan. Um, it's very, very comprehensive and, and forward-looking, uh, and it understands, uh, we understand it conforms to the provisions of the Provincial Growth Plan for the Greater Toronto-Hamilton Area, uh, more than meeting growth targets for the subject area. As such, it provides a much-needed comprehensive basis for evaluating development applications currently under review, including many applications for tall buildings, which have been appealed to the OMB. So it's essential that this plan be adopted in order to improve the city's ability to defend its position on these appeals, um, as well as to deal with applicants that will be made in future. And frankly, for the residents of this area, they're looking for some certainty as to the future of the area. It's, it's just been so, um, so uncertain up to this point. A critical problem for the Young Edmonton area is the pressure on infrastructure of all types. Um, as a result of the surge in development in the area. The plan provides um, what seems to be effective guidance for building heights, uh, provides for better setbacks and improved public realm, and defines clear requirements for improved infrastructure of all types, physical infrastructure, community service facilities, green infrastructure, including new public parks, public transit, and other transportation infrastructure, um, walking and, and biking. It sets out a clear vision statement for the different and diverse areas that comprise the Young Edmonton area, and that such provides clear guidance as to where future growth should be located. The, well, and a very important point is that it, it, it stresses the importance of greater office employment in the area, um, although taking into account some of the comments just now, it, it's apparent that there, there are, could be improvements in that area. One. Um, concern which has been raised already today, um, which we would um, share some of the concerns, is around building heights. Um, there were changes made to the plan um, that, that was issued on in uh, May 
uh, compared with the, um, uh, the plan that was discussed in, in November of 2017. Um, the usual discussion around heights um, relates to, from staff, relates to the fact that there are models uh, that have been worked on, computerized models, 3D modeling of, of the, the landscape and shadowing and so on that would result from the development. Um, I think um, something that would be helpful to the public to understand and maybe, be, maybe be better understand what's going on with heights would be to be a little bit more open and uh, transparent in terms of those models. Um, the, the public meetings have, have been excellent, but a little bit more transparency about the, the uh, mechanical um, working through of those models would, would I think, be very helpful. So um, a particular area of concern um, has been brought forward around the northeast quadrant of um, Young and Eglinton. Uh, clearly, there's been different levels of involvement of different communities, been very strong involvement, as, you, as you're aware, from South, South Eglinton Ratepayer Association to the area in the, the southeast quadrant. Uh, there's been a lot of, lot of involvement from the northwest quadrant through EPRA and somewhat from Arica, uh, maybe less so in, in, the, in some of the other areas. Um, so the um, concerns are coming out now about heights. So we would recommend that the committee recommend to, to City Council that direction be given to reduce the specified heights of new buildings on the north side of Eglinton uh, back to the heights shown in uh, the draft secondary plan proposal submitted to this committee at the November meeting. Now I'll pass over to John, to John Boston. Thank you. I really want to uh, focus on, uh, on two things. Oh, sorry. Oh, it wasn't on. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to focus on two things. First of all, uh, on the necessity of passing a plan like this. Uh, the, the Young Eglinton area has essentially, in, is an area in which development has gotten out of control. Uh, that's partly due to the fact that the OMB, uh, in the way it's operated, uh, looking at sites, sites without considering effects elsewhere in the community, uh, it's also the, the result of the fact that, unfortunately, we have not had a plan for the Young Eglinton area uh, uh, since a relatively inadequate plan was passed back in 2002. It's essential that we have the protection of a plan. I want to give uh, a lot of credit to the planning staff uh, for the amount of work they put into it. Uh, the, uh, they've uh, evaluated not just the built form of the area, but what's required to make it function better as a community. Uh, all, of, uh, all of those elements of the plan are very important, and we r applaud what the staff has done. I think it's a first-rate plan. I think it's actually uh, one of the best plans that have come out of the planning staff uh, since the Central Area Plan back 30 years ago. So uh, I want, first of all, to say that. Secondly, I would like to come to the question of infrastructure. Uh, the, it's, it, and here, I mean, comments have been made uh, before in this meeting about the fact that water pressure is a problem. That is true, and that's a problem, and that's becoming a problem even in existing buildings in the Summerhill area, for example, south of Young Eglinton, uh, because of the uh, demands uh, that new buildings have created on the water supply. We know that the sewage system is increasingly inadequate. And uh, in the Summerhill area, we see that in the amount of uh, stormwater that gets diverted into the ravines and seriously erodes the ravines. Uh, we, know, we also see it, and I'm talking from a Summerhill point of view, simply to emphasize the importance of the Young Eglinton plan, because the impact of the Young Eglinton plan is much broader than just Young Eglinton. Uh, in a Summerhill subway station, it's virtually impossible uh, to get on the subway during the morning rush hour. Uh, people in the summer area that commute to the downtown and need to be down by, let's say, 9.30, uh, have to typically have to wait for four or five cars before a door opens where there's enough space where it's not so fully packed that you can't get on. 
the subway issue is going to get worse. And so I turn to the slide that's, uh, that's up on the uh, screen. Uh, the, uh, this is just putting together s uh, some of the implications as we see it, drawing on the reports uh, from staff and also from uh, uh, planners hired to defend developments before the OMB. Uh, in, it, we're talking about a huge increase in the number of new units uh, in the Young Corridor, not just in Young Eglinton, but also feeding to it along the uh, new uh, Eglinton Crosstown link. Uh, and also in, to the north, in North York and north of Eglinton. Uh, we're also, of course, contributing to that in the Young St. Clair area, which is, but, but the point that I want to emphasize is that all of this is resulting in a huge increase in, uh, in uh, ridership. Uh, the, if we look at the, I, I just put a slide up on the screen uh, on uh, what these estimates mean. The Young Street uh, subway capacity is being increased currently uh, by signaling improvements and so forth. It's estimated that'll increase the capacity by approximately 15%. These, the lines you see up on the screen, uh, the dashed line and the solid line are the sort of the, uh, the uh, so-called low capacity and high capacity lines uh, of the TTC. As you can see, in, by 2023, uh, we're substantially above the high end of the expanded capacity, uh, starting, uh, starting at uh, Eglinton uh, and expanding as you go down. Uh, the congestion at young, that, uh, the Bloor Young Station uh, is going to be extreme. As we've already seen instances uh, where that has been a serious issue. It's going to get worse. So uh, we would like to recommend that uh, because the surge of development has essentially put the previous. Uh, Sorry, I, just, just to no, you know, no, we, you had 10 minutes and you knew what it is. And okay. we have it in your presentation as well. All right, you have it in our presentation. Yes, I know. You're just repeating your presentation. I'm trying to be polite with that. Okay. But I, I appreciate that because I've seen the charts and read the presentation. Yes. Are there questions of the deputant? You may get to answer your extra comments anyways. Of course. Um, Councillor Robinson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. My first question is for Jeff Cattell, head of Fontra. So um, as soon as the report was released, I reached out to you uh, right after the public meeting, and we've talked, spoken a couple times. Uh, my first concern was with the upzoning that happened and then really, really wasn't um, shared broadly with the public. Uh, not just along Eglinton, but specifically along Eglinton, the upzoning took place, but just all along Young, you and I have talked about, as well as Roehampton and Broadway. So would you support us trying to uh, alter that as it stands? Um, absolutely. I, I don't think um, that the, the, you know, the comparison of November 7, 2017 to May 2018 has really been done. I'm not aware. We, it, was, it was a surprise to us. We, we understand that there were meetings with various stakeholders and maybe there were changes that came out of those meetings, but we weren't aware. Um, of the, It wasn't entirely transparent. And it was, a, it was also a surprise to me. Yes. And we shared that. Um, I also would like to just ask you about representation at FONTRA, at, as part of FONTRA meetings. Mm -hmm. um, has the northeast quadrant of Young and Eglinton had representation, had a voice around the FONTRA table in the past few years? I would say not consistently. Not consistently. Yeah. So you would say that the residents who live in the northeast quadrant maybe haven't been represented or had a voice at the table on issues that you're dealing with? I would say that's fair. Yeah. That's a fair comment. Yeah. Okay. Thank I mean, I mean, uh, uh, these things are voluntary, right? No, nobody was requiring anybody to go to meetings, and, and people don't want more meetings. Um, but we do have a very active group, and 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 that quadrant is not has not been strongly represented in the last few years. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. And that leads me to my my next point and final point, and that is that the need, uh, as you know, I've been pressing for uh, another uh, community consultation. Partially because of the reason you just cited. And counsel, um, so it's the final question. Okay, so here not, it comes. Not points. So points would, you get in would speaking. You, would you, listen, let's make it fair across the board. I'm trying to. Okay, that's good. 
Um, would you support the intent or the idea of a community consultation, given the two things you've said, the surprise of the upzoning, coupled with the fact that the Northeast Quadrant hasn't really had a voice in, this, in some of this? Yes, um, we, we, we do, do, would want to see it well planned and well organized and, and expeditiously organized, um, so as not to lose the, the, the window right now uh, before Council loses its mandate. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions of Mr. Cattell or the other deputants? No, not seeing any. Thank you very much. We will move on to Glenn Robinson. Then I have Maria Yanu. Mr. Robinson, you're here. Okay, and then after it's Maria, then Avner Mandelman, and then Vesna Malaska. So, Mr. Robinson, you've got your five minutes. Okay, uh, thank you for letting me speak here today. Uh, my name is Glenn Robinson. I have lived on Broadway Avenue for 17 years. Um, I've just been watching how the neighborhood's evolved a little bit. Um, I've noticed up to a few years ago, uh, the neighborhood consisted of office towers near Young and Eglinton at the corner there. Uh, they extended a bit to the west and a bit to the east along Eglinton and then to the south along Young um, down through the Canadian Tire area. Um, now the blocks on Young immediately to the north of Eglinton yeah. were a shopping area, um, almost not quite a village because it's quite busy, but it was kind of an entertainment area, restaurants, um, there, were no, there were no high rises, there were mid rises, there was lots of sunshine in that area. Um, and that was a very, very pleasant, very pedestrian friendly area, uh, Main Street. Okay, and it was also considered for years the most desirable neighborhood in Toronto um, mm. to live in. And most recently um, by Toronto Life in magazine in 2014, this was considered the most desirable neighborhood. Um, so what's happening now is about a quarter of that young shopping strip has been smashed by wrecking balls. Um, Numerous high-rise towers have gone up in the northeast quadrant. Um, on Broadway, there is severe gridlock every rush hour with continual honking of horns and increasing instances of aggression and road rage. Uh, it's an ordeal to, to ride the subway downtown. Um, quality of life has definitely gotten worse. Um, the proposed plan continues uh, the destruction of the young shopping area and makes it difficult to impossible to get downtown. Um, with walls of condos on Roehampton and Broadway, uh, gridlock and road rage in the area will increase. Um, and then I actually um, no. did a comparison of secondary, all secondary studies that have over five, secondary plans that have over 5,000 residential units. And that, uh, get it right here. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the proposed, um, the proposed secondary plans over 5,000 residential units. It's the ratio of proposed residential units to proposed commercial gross floor area. Okay, so it shows uh, smashingly clearly uh, the point that, uh, that someone else was making a, f uh, a, f a few minutes ago, the fact that we're basically building, building a, a hugely excessive amount of residence in a, in, as compared to other buildings. And we're basically turning us into a, a big residential ghetto. Um, um, so I, I've also been convinced over the last uh, attending these meetings that we definitely do need a plan for sure. Um, okay, so I'm just requesting that, that the portion involving the strip of Young Street and the Northeast area uh, be reviewed and put out for further consultation uh, by the residents. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's questions of you from Councillor Robinson. Thank you. I'll be very brief. Um, thank you for coming today and, uh, and exposing this, this issue. Um, so the, there are currently 62K people and 33K jobs in the secondary plan area. Uh, the ratio of people to jobs is going down. Um, what impact do you think this will happen? Well, will have. It's already you're already feeling it and sensing it in the neighborhood. But if it, this continues down this path, what would the outcome be? Well, I think we're going to have more and more people that are living in the area that um, they there's nowhere for them to work because it's all residents going out. 
So they're going to have to commute. Uh, meanwhile, we don't have any uh, really any means to commute downtown. Part of the problem is we have, we're, get, we're putting the people to downtown area without any of the amenities. We don't have any of the arts or the culture or anything like that. We're just putting thousands, just packing thousands and thousands of people in here. Okay, and another um, thing you touched on today was the, and we haven't heard a lot about that, is the congestion and gridlock, particularly I'll reference Broadway. Roehampton, those streets. Could you just um, expand a bit on the on the issues that are impacting not just motorists but pedestrians, cyclists, all all road users? It's 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 really severe, both in the morning and in the evening. Um, in the morning, it's especially a problem because there's there's also children trying to go to school. We have two schools right there, right by the corner of Young and Broadway there. Um, meanwhile, we have residents. I think a lot of them are passing through, but one thing for sure, they're all in a hurry, and none of them are getting anywhere. And then we have trucks that are block, always blocking the area. The road is very narrow. Um, so we have people, we have continual chorus of honking. Uh, like you have to shut your windows at rush hour because all you hear is honking. And increasingly you hear people yelling and screaming out there. They're, you know, they're getting, starting to get really angry. Um, it's, it's a pretty, uh, it, it can be entertaining, but it's a, it's a pretty, uh, it's not a, a great situation. Okay, thank you very much. I don't have any other questions of you. Thank you very much for coming. I have Maria Ayanu. Is that close? It's actually Miria and Ioannu. Ah, uh, it's spelled that way on my sheet. Yeah, I know. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I live on Broadway Avenue and I'm a member of the Republic Residents Association that represents 25 Broadway, 70 Roehampton and the students and parents of North Toronto Collegiate. Uh, we as a group welcome the growth, diversity and accessibility to our neighborhood. Uh, this is already an apartment neighborhood and has been for many years. There are already many rental units and we know that more are needed. And condominiums have added to the appeal of the neighborhood and it's updating. So we support the idea of the Midtown in Focus plan, the secondary plan, and its overall purpose of guiding and controlling the development in the Young and Eglinton neighborhood. However, with due respect to the folks who have already made some of these presenta some, uh, presentations, we object to the egregious density, height, and intense overdevelopment that is targeting two streets. Roehampton and Broadway Avenues. The way the, in the Northeast Quadrant, and I think a number of people have already mentioned it. Uh, the way the plan stands now creates a concrete wall around these two blocks, as I'm sure you've seen on map 2112. Uh, after all this work that the planning department has done and that many of us have participated, maybe not as intensely as some of the other groups, we've all attended all the community consultations. Uh, surely we can come up with a plan that spreads out this intensity and growth a little more evenly and does not pit neighborhoods against neighborhood, which is, we see that having the potential of happening. Uh, to this end, we are asking for a community consultation that focuses on the intense development of these two streets. Uh, we have had good experience working with developers and we have had success coming to some amicable agreements. We're reasonable people and we don't think it's too much to ask for reasonable development that takes into account some of the things that have already been mentioned today, including the stress to infrastructure, the traffic gridlock, safe sidewalks for the children who are attending the local schools, and many of our residents who need uh, subsidized housing and who are using wheelchairs, the need for green space, which does not appear anywhere in this plan focusing specifically on our two streets and uh, the livability of our community. Uh, and we think that we can make it so that we are not put in the bullseye of the development and essentially feeling like a two block community that is under siege. 
So we are asking for a community consultation, and I think a number of people have already addressed that. Thank you. Are there questions of the deputy? Councillor Robinson. I would like to um, ask you a couple of questions. You submitted a very impressive, excellent summary of the issues in the neighbourhood, so I understand that's gone to all the committee members? Yes, it has. Okay, and I hope that they'll each take time to read it because it was very well thought out and put together, so thank you for that. Um, in, in this letter that you've submitted, um, you talked about many things and you've addressed them today, but I know what you were getting at in your remarks is distribution. And it feels like you've said a, you've got a bullseye target on, on the two streets that you have. Uh, you represent many people on those streets. Uh, you've got a very big organization. So my question to you is, could the city really address this in a more effective way by sharing the, sharing the wealth, if you might, uh, might call it that, or a better distribution across across the city of these this high level of intensification that we're experiencing? Definitely. I think lowering the heights, you've already talked a little bit about that, would make a difference. Giving us some kind of green space, more space between the buildings, that would make a huge difference in this wall that has essentially been, could possibly be allowed to be built uh, on the east side of Young Street and on the north side of Eglinton, which essentially creates uh, a, a concrete wall around us, around the two specific blocks. Okay, excellent. And um, your, your president or the head of your um, organization, Jerry, couldn't be here today, but she mentioned to me after the public meeting she was surprised to see some of the numbers. She hadn't seen that before. Is that a general feeling? You mean the heights? Yeah, the heights. Oh, definitely. This is the first time that we saw this last week when we had the other, the, the general meeting. So yes, we were quite shocked and this is an issue that's come up several times, which is we would go to consultations, we would see the presentations and they all look fantastic and they keep changing. The heights keep getting increased and then lo and behold, we are we're presented with a um, we're presented with a map that looks like we've just been enclosed in a concrete wall. Okay, and you mentioned also livability, which uh, we've heard from many residents in that area. I really want to make sure my colleagues understand the lack of green space in that area. Uh, could you again comment on that and this concept of a red path loop, which uh, some of your counter your colleagues. Uh, have mentioned that they didn't think that was even achievable because of buildings being in the way of a potential red path loop, which would have created a bit of a, a necklace effect, uh, a green necklace, but um, very, ch very challenging to implement. So if you could just talk about the lack of green space. Yes, we would love to have green space. We do have the, uh, the uh, North Toronto Collegiate Field, which is really not green, it's red fake grass, uh, which is really not the kind of park space that we would like. Also, there is, I think you mentioned it before, the, uh, the tiny little red path park, mm -hmm. uh, which needs to be either expanded or upgraded or something needs to be done to it. Uh, the loop is, of course, a great idea, but I have a feeling a lot of us will be long gone by the time that actually happens, mm. even though some of us may feel a little bit older today <laughs> than we did before. <laughs> so that is a big issue for us. And then the other thing is around the sidewalk size. A lot of us have great difficulty with that. We know that there's been an effort on Roehampton to expand the sidewalk, but that's a tiny little area. If you try to use a si the sidewalk on Broadway going from our building at 25 Broadway out to Young Street, it is we are so thankful that no one so far has been uh, injured or even killed, including many of the kids who are using the, the sidewalk. It is incredibly narrow, incredibly overcrowded. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions? <coughs> Not seeing any. Thank you for coming. I have Avner Mandelman. Is Avner Mandelman here? Okay, and I have Vesna Alevska, and that's the final dip. Oh, sorry, I have two more after that. 
Hello, my name is Vesna Milevska, and I'm going to take less than five minutes because I'm terrified of public skip speaking, but I have to come. <laughs> uh, I've been living on a young Kadangalan term for 21 years, <clears throat> and what is happening now is, is a crime. We are losing our community, we are losing uh, what we have built and communities about people, about schools, and about parks. Communities not built by the high-rise and a concrete and a, um, and a noise. So um, I think lots of, uh, uh, lots of people raised the question about uh, the density and um, people uh, who will, the, the hundred, over 120,000 people who will live in our area, but I want to tell you the effect what right now we just, this building has on my health and many people who I've been talking to. The noise is incredible. Starts at 6.30 in the morning with the trucks, huge trucks actually i have a just this morning live picture and a noise you can experience i believe nobody from the city has come and measured the noise level which is dangerous my ears are buzzing constantly monday to saturday evening the only real release i have is sunday because the construction goes for six hours the other issue is a dust and i've been uh, um, because it's so much dust is affecting our lungs. I've been going in the last year to my doctors. They couldn't discover anything about my ears. Everything fine. Nothing in my uh, and And just conclusion is the noise and dust we are breathing. And the last thing what I want to tell you is the sidewalks. We have lost our sidewalks in, uh, in Roy Hampton and, uh, and, and, and Broadway, all of them. We don't have them, we don't have half of the streets because the city allowed the builders to take away our sidewalks and part of the streets. So there is no walking, there is no driving. I had a senior crying last winter, not being able to walk to the senior home because there were two trucks parked on our sidewalks. And that's not acceptable. So please take a look come to Young and England on Monday to Friday for one hour, any time of the day, try to walk and try to have a conversation. I will personally uh, uh, make you a coffee at my place to, to see how I feel every day because I walk from home. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you, uh, Festa. Are there questions? So um, I wanted to thank you for coming because Although we're not dealing with the impact of construction and what happens to people that live in the area, I think it's still important for people to hear that. And I would suggest you have probably called 311, but you should call them every time that you have a concern. Construction cannot start before 7 and should finish by 7. And then I'm sure if you also contact your local counselor's office, after you've contacted 311, they can enforce the request for enforcement in the area. And that might also be helpful because it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to live through the situation of construction on an ongoing basis. I have actually we called City Hall and unfortunately they it will take two days for somebody to come and it's uh, I, 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 and, and the other thing, I'm sorry to take more time, I said less than five minutes, uh, I have called city and um, three occasions, there are three cases about uh, cement truck, trucks washing their trucks on our Roehampton Street and city had to come and clean the, the, the sewage on our expenses, not on the builders were just worn. I, I said that I'm, I'm sure if you place the concern with 311 and call your local counselor, that they will try to work on your behalf. Thank it you. is difficult because you have to get someone out on the site to see the problem, to issue infraction notices, but we do try very hard during construction to do that, and I 
think that your local councillor would be able to assist you and would want to help you in finding ways to relieve that because you're speaking on behalf of not just yourself, but of all your neighbours in the community. And I know the sensitivity of all my colleagues that live in that area to that. So I'm just suggesting call them and let them do everything they can. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, we'll be able to find a way to at least try to clamp down on that some more for you. Thank you for coming. I have Tony Gardner. And then I have Mark Benelier. So Tony is first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is this microphone on? Do I have to push the button? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I also am a member of the RRA. My wife and I moved to Toronto from Vancouver three and a half years ago to be close to our children and grandchildren. Reading the Midtown Vision statement, I can understand why many in the neighboring areas would support it. It envisions a livable and complete community with new buildings, parks, open spaces, and green infrastructure projects to improve our air and water quality, unquote. The official plan outlines the various character areas and the charming qualities which will be maintained to keep the character of areas such as Erskine and Kiwaton, the Red Park Street Loop area, the Sudan character area, etc. But I see no mention of the character of the Broadway Roehampton area, which does not seem to be part of the vision statement. It is already a high density area, and the Midtown plan calls for much, much greater density with no provision for any significant green space. Although we have the North Toronto Collegiate Field, it is primarily for the school's use with public access for sports and other leisure use facilities. We're told that there is no land for such facilities and to purchase it would be too costly. Shockingly, money generated from several new developments on our two streets will help fund a Sudan Parkhead south of Eglinton, far from our area. Furthermore, the narrow sidewalks and streets were laid out, as was previously mentioned, when the area housed residential homes and low-rise buildings. So we already have overcrowded walkways and impossible traffic. To add insult to injury, with no positive amenities for our area, we are asked to accept a plan that allows 50 plus story high rises from Eglinton North to Broadway and East to Redpath. We see a future with much greater density, worsening pedestrian and vehicular traffic and years of unrelenting construction. We're bearing the brunt of growth without the positive improvements outlined in your vision statement. It's not too late to counteract the decisions made by the OMB, which will still rule on the many development application appeals submitted before the deadline. The official plan amendment could be more stringent in areas such as ours and lower new building heights to mitigate what the OMB is approving and outline a more measured and slower rate of development to allow some catching up of the infrastructure and make the construction disruption more tolerable. For those of us in the area of Roehampton and Broadway, this plan does not fulfill the vision statement for a livable, complete community with amenities to improve our quality of life. The RRA has already submitted a well thought out and detailed position paper, which has been mentioned. I have a copy with me and I trust you will give it your full attention. By the way, um, that concludes my presentation, but I too would like to invite you, Mr. Chair and your, your members to come up, take the subway up to Young and Eglinton, walk up to Roehampton, walk east on Roehampton down a red path, north to Broadway, back to Young Street again, and you'll get a true flavor between the hours of 7 and 6 p.m. on a weekday of what life is like these days. Thank you. Questions of the deputant? So I, I have one. Yes, sir. Would you be surprised to know that I have, I do, constantly know and walk the area and understand what's happening? I'm delighted, sir. You have, you have a flavor of what life is like these days. I have a taste of sand in my mouth. <laughs> Accidents are waiting to happen, I'm afraid to say. But. I would ask you another question then. I'm going to abuse my opportunity for questions. How enjoyable is the walk now down from Broadway down to Young and Eglinton and south again when you go from sunlight to wind tunnel and dark 
and back to sunlight when you get a block south. It's not like the, some of the real trails in the city. By the way, the 50 story plus buildings that are proposed for the north side of Anglington, that will, that will take a more light from both the school playground and the streets themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. The last speaker I have is Mark Penelier. Is that pronounced properly and is he here? Looking for Mark. B-A-N-N-E-L-I-E-R. Not seeing any, that's my last call for Mr. Ellier. I had an Abner Mandelman, which isn't here. I had a Clive Raymond, which is left, and I had a Mike Drawer. And that's all the names of the Pearsons that I had on the public speaking list. So we have now concluded that. Um, are there questions of staff? And in the meantime as well, just, um, I'm just going to confer with clerks because there was a motion being drafted for me to place on behalf of my colleagues. Just having them double -checked with, uh, so to my colleagues on committee and to my colleagues in council that are here, there is a motion that we have to put forward and then to go through a process that we have to try and deal with the issues that have been resolved. Um, do you want a chance to read that in writing, or is it okay if we put it up on the screen after? Do I have to waste the paper? Okay, so once we have it finished, I'll have it up on the screen uh, at the appropriate time for my colleagues to read. So, Councillor Robinson, you had some questions of staff? Uh, my questions are, in your own report, it says this is already the most densely populated urban growth centre in the Greater Golden Horseshoe, correct? Uh, through you, uh, Chair, yes, that is correct. Um, it is a small geography in comparison to uh, some of the other urban growth centres, but uh, it is the most densely populated currently. So I have a hundred questions I can ask you, but there's not enough time. So I'm just going to zero on a few that really reflect some of the comments from the constituents and uh, the deputants here today. Um, there's a number of uh, streets that really there's a m significant impact on. There already has been uh, because it's been like the Wild West at Young and Eglinton. And I've spoken both at executive and council about that many times. But uh, in your plan, it really, uh, the, the, the neighbours in the area of Eglinton, Roehampton and Broadway feel that they've got a bullseye on their backs. Um, my question to you is this, is there not a way to, to do more distribution across the city than everything happening in the young Eglinton area? Because certainly that's the feedback and the questions I've had put to me as a local, one of the local city councillors is why Young and Eglinton, I understand, you know, there's a transit being built, there's transit there, although the ATC allows it not to be very reliable or uh, have serious capacity issues. But um, bottom line is, what about just better distribution across the city? Uh, through the chair, that, that is exactly the, the official plan. Uh, it, it, over the long term, seeks to grow um, through Etobicoke Center, Scarborough Center, North York Center, Young and Eglinton, and the downtown, and focus the growth in those centers and distribute the growth in those centers and across our avenues in a way that aligns with our existing and future planned transit network. Uh, ultimately, that is the goal to distribute the growth. Uh, factors that have uh, concentrated the growth, of course, up and down the Young Line, you've seen it in North York Center and in Young and Eglinton and downtown as the attractiveness of the areas, the, uh, the existing transit that is there, the marketability of the sites, uh, the land value dynamic that's in play and has been in play for a decade. Uh, and they, and they've, they are uh, currently the most attractive places to, to sell and market uh, residential development. At the same time, we've been encouraging as much as we can the distribution of employment growth across the city also aligned with our transit system. And there again, you see the dynamic of the uh, land values that are uh, variable across the city and our ability to attract jobs to some areas uh, versus other areas is, uh, is uneven. 
because uh, zoning and official plan designations are not a panacea alone for the market attractiveness of some of these areas. Okay, my other question is related to parks and green space in this area and clearly a, a major deficit in the northeast quadrant of the plan. Uh, I'm guessing largely because of the value of the land. But um, again, the feeling is that th these, I these concepts, um, like the Red Path Loop, uh, although sound very magical, they would have to happen on an incremental basis, meaning, as one of our deputants said, and many of us won't see that in our lifetime. So what interim measures do you propose for an area that has such a significant park deficit? Red Path Park, again, just a few, this table times a few is the size of it. Um, it's just not enough to create a livable community or a sustainable community when it's a concrete jungle. So well, how do we address the lack of parks that are in your plan for the northeast quadrant of uh, Young and Eglinton? Just to make one general comment and then hand it over to Ms. Ritz. The, th there's no doubt that it's a challenge. You're master planning in an infill context, not unlike uh, our experience with TO Core. So we've laid down a, a parks and public realm plan that I think works very creatively to, to discover and determine uh, how to best uh, develop and accentuate the public realm, add on to existing parks. Yes, create uh, new parks, but uh, we have the frustration of very expensive land to contend with. So we've had to be more creative. That's why you see recommendations to uh, create a connection of, of, of public space to larger existing parks and perhaps new parks, such as the overbuild for the Davisville uh, yards. I'll let uh, Ms. Ritz just expand on that. Um, one of the key policy directions uh, through the chair uh, in the plan along streets like the Red Path Park Street Loop as well as the Davisville Community Street is to secure on-site parkland as part of any redevelopment. Um, so we don't necessarily show it on uh, any of the plans itself. That is a key policy direction. Um, and with respect to the Red Path Park Street Loop and its delivery, um, we fully intend to be delivering that as uh, part of the redevelopment and the development applications. Um, and we're fully within our rights at the city to request that as part of the development. So we do anticipate that that will start to uh, materialize shortly. Uh, lastly, thank you. Thank, uh, lastly, do you support uh, additional community consultation on this plan? Uh, okay. Certainly, given the complexity of what's before the committee and the nature of the deputations today, I don't have any objection to additional consultation, no. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions from members of the committee? So I, I would just like to ask one question we haven't down, gone down the road of, and it would be to Mr. Geronimo. There, there was a question raised about water and sewer capacity, in particular, sewer capacity is becoming a greater issue around the city when we try to look at things comprehensively as you found in the waterfront as we recently found in a development area in the community i represent so can you give us a brief update as to is there capacity now what improvements are being in place and what type of storage facilities are going to have to be there um, or might have to be put in place. Because I've gone as far as hearing that some buildings may have to build storage capacity within their own buildings and then wait for a later date in high storm or other areas for that sewage to be able to go down the line. Mr. Chair, what I'll do is I'll give a quick general overview of infrastructure issues and I'll hand it off to Toronto Water Staff to answer some of those specific ones on, on storage. Watch uh, the so time too. I'll watch the time. So in general, uh, the big issue in this area has to do more with the storm sewers. When you, when you take a look and analyze the storm sewer system, you do have some uh, problem uh, situations even today existing with overland flow and capacity issues. With respect to sanitary sewers, generally today uh, the, in dry weather conditions, everything's performing as designed. Unfortunately, when it rains, we do have some locations where even the sanitary systems, because it is a partly combined system in that area as well, it's an older system, we do have uh, some issues with sanitary. On the water main side, uh, we do have some localized issues with respect to fire flows. 
because uh, you have a mixture of, of different pipe sizes and age, as well as the complexities of a boundary issue that predated amalgamation, where we need to catch up with some infrastructure. So that's the existing situation. The short answer on to deal with growth, you need to make investments of about $110 million over that time period uh, to deal with that growth. Now on site-specific ones, I'll hand off to team on some of the issues uh, on development-related matters that you see on, on applications for storage, holdage tanks, inline storage. Um, uh, uh, gee, Mr. Chair, the um, Toronto Water is not supportive of on-site storage tanks for sanitary sewage. Um, it is common practice to detain stormwater, uh, but not sanitary sewage. So if I could uh, just clarify that point. So there are cases where we'll ask people to hold stormwater on site, and it's part of the wet weather flow guidelines and the way they design new buildings. There are some requests made by developers for us also to hold sanitary flows and discharge it at another time of the day. Uh, from Toronto Water's perspective, that is not a standard that we, we find acceptable because to us, it's hard to control when the domestic flow is going to happen, so you should have constant flow out of a building as opposed to a storm situation, which is a peak. So that's the two issues on tanks that Toronto Water has taken. We'll look at storm tanks for temporary storage during a storm, but sanitary tanks uh, we are not supportive of. Is there, <laughs> is there sufficient capacity now for the units that have been approved but not built? Uh, to you, Mr. Chair, uh, by and large, there are no showstoppers at this time with respect to the underground uh, systems in that area. But as the general manager has pointed out, uh, when we're dealing, if we look at strictly uh, dry weather flows, the systems that are in place are more than adequate. The issue arises in the context of wet weather flows. And given the, uh, the number of combined sewers in the area and the existing storm sewers, that is where we feel a pinch point with respect to modeling some of those high uh, stormwater flows that could occur in that area. So by and large, basically, the, the combined sewer system, 80% uh, of it functions exactly as it's supposed to. It is the remaining 20% in the context of those large storm events that become surcharged. And, and if the development does not attenuate those extra storm flows properly, even though our guidelines say they must, you will just worsen the present situation. So that's an issue of why we have uh, the wet weather flow guidelines and developers must improve the storm situation uh, to proceed with any development. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Then we are going to go to speakers. Councillor Matlow to speak. So, um, uh, oh, um, is the motion ready? <clears throat> so their clerks are still working with staff on, Keep working on the motion, uh, but if you're okay to speak, I'll try and have it up so it won't, it won't, it won't impact. Uh, the, yeah. Please, um, please speak, Councillor Maslow. I need someone to take up some time. <laughs> Do you think you could help me with that? Oh, I don't know. That's going to be that's going to be tough. <laughs> um, so uh, I want to begin by uh, thanking our. And uh, can we take down the the overhead? We have an overhead still over there forever. Yeah. I'd like to thank uh, our staff, uh, uh, led by uh, Paul Farish, along with Cassidy Ritz, uh, and so many members of their team, along with our chief planner, uh, who led uh, what, what, what I experienced, which was the most consultative process I have ever witnessed uh, from the city of Toronto. Dozens of community meetings and pop-up events and you know, farmers markets, subways, uh, uh, small workshops, uh, a, a local working group uh, made up of uh, ratepayers associations and tenants associations and BIAs and, uh, and condo boards and uh, institutions like the Ann Johnson Health Station and you know many basically stakeholders in the community coming together uh, over the past uh, uh, two years. Uh, but then even before that, uh, we did the Midtown of Focus 1 uh, plan, which focused on public realm. So first we did the public realm component, and now this is sort of the everything else uh, portion of the plan, which is essentially a study of the secondary plan. So for years now, um, uh, there has been uh, unbridled growth in, in the Young and Eglinton secondary plan area. 
The, the root of this began back in 2005, 2006, with the uh, the passage of the Places to Grow Act and the uh, and the growth plan. And the province decided to prescribe growth at specific urban cent urban growth centers, including Young and Eglinton. The idea of that, as I've told my community, was a good idea because the whole the concept is to mitigate sprawl onto the Oak Ridges Marine and the Green Belt, and to have uh, specific intensified areas within urban urban zones. That being said, there was nothing there to ensure in law that the quality of life would keep up with the pace of growth. So what we've seen is that the population has exploded, condo, 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 but it hasn't kept a balance with employment, it hasn't, uh, uh, the public realm hasn't kept up with the needs. The school capacity, the schools are overcrowded, the school board has had to struggle to actually not only move around the catchment areas recently, but in fact, they actually had to take all the sixth grade classes out of the elementary schools, move them into the middle school, and now they're still trying to figure out what to do with Eglinton Public School, and now they're changing the catchment area there. They really don't know what to do, and they're subject to provincial decisions about capital dollars, which they have a dearth of. In fact, they have a multi-billion dollar capital backlog in the, in the TDSB. So, it doesn't stop there. You could look at transit. Every public meeting we have, and in our plan, it says you should be intensifying along the subway line. Theoretically, that's a wonderful idea. The problem is that the, the line one, the young line, those of you who use it will know, if you're, if, you're, if you're at the platform in the morning or afternoon peak hours, you're typically waiting one, two, three, if not more trains that go by before getting on. And once you're in there, you're like squeezed in like a sardine. And, and then there's delays, as we all know, and all these issues. So you don't know practically if you're going to get to work on time or school on time. Um, and then may, many people understandably select to use a car because the subway isn't reliable. Um, and there's been many years of inaction uh, up until recently to actually move forward with the relief uh, subway line. So um, pipes and wires are concerned too, as Lou was saying earlier about sewer capacity. There are concerns about electrical capacity. And um, we've needed this secondary plan review for a long time. Um, I also want to acknowledge, by the way, uh, I, I kind of just alluded to and I referred to the associations, but I want to, everyone from the Republic Residents Association to Sarah, uh, to uh, Fontra, uh, and I could go on and on, to, like st all the different associations in the area, they haven't just been sort of um, at the meetings, they've really been involved in a lot of the detailed policy discussions. Um, they are in many ways co-authors of where we're going to go. Now, what we've heard recently from, uh, if I call them co-authors, uh, uh, from a residents in part of my ward in the northeast quadrant, uh, uh, northeast of Young and Eglinton, is that while there may only really be a couple of soft sites left, given the amount of development in, in the area in, in, in recent years, there's a significant concern that even if there's only a couple places, that this will further exacerbate um, the impact and quality of life that these, they've experienced and already a dearth of services and green space and et cetera. Um, and they don't believe that that is acceptable. And that's why I think it's incredibly important to go back to the community <coughs> and have a meeting, as we're discussing, you're gonna see a motion soon, to do that and then to understand you know, what they would support and what they think is reasonable, while also balancing our need to make sure that we have strength within this policy so it isn't successfully appealed by a developer. So we need to kind of arrive there and then come back and get something passed next month. Um, I also wanna add, um, that we are, we are starting to, you know, while we acknowledge all the problems, we're starting to incrementally push back. So, you know, we as a community led the fight to abolish the OMB and the government listened to us. And now we have a new body, the Local Plan and Appeals Tribunal. The proof will be in the pudding to see sort of how it rolls out, but the reforms that are part of that are significant and critically important. We also fought to get the well, secondary Councilor, plan. Well, Councillor, while I asked you to stretch it. Are you ready with the motion? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I have it. <laughs> okay, so. I, I have to, if I didn't put some qualifications oh, on it, okay, we'd, allow, I'd miss the vote me, tonight in the election. Allow me, if I may, uh, just to conclude by saying this. What I want to see as part of this, and I wrote a letter to committee uh, to, to have staff uh, consider this, is while we're debating about the heights, I, somebody said earlier, let, let's not, let this not be a kind of community versus community kind of issue. No, we are one community. We are Young and Eglinton. Anything that happens in a neighborhood in Young and Eglinton impacts the entire community. I think we need to be looking at holding bylaws on new applications to actually give real time for the infrastructure and social services to finally meet the pace of development that's already happened. 
So rather than haggle over 10 stories or versus 80 stories, we should actually have a pause to allow for uh, the services to keep up with the growth. And I think that's where we need to go as a community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Robinson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I want to start by thanking staff for uh, their extensive work, particularly Paul Farish and Cassidy. Um, I also uh, really want to thank the constituents and the deputants that came out today, some of them on very short notice, some of them who just really learned about this last night, and one gentleman had to leave because he couldn't stay all day, but he just literally found out about this last night and then came, made his way to City Hall today. So I thought they made excellent presentations. Uh, it can be a very intimidating setting to speak here, and they all did a great job. Uh, I think Vesna uh, spoke about the real emotion of the neighbourhood, um, and where she displayed the fact that people feel it's not livable, it's a concrete jungle, it's even affecting people's health. So that's how far we've, we've uh, gone in the Young Eglinton area. I also want to just, before I forget, thank Councillor Shiner who has been, as the chair of this committee, uh, a huge support uh, to all of us, particularly me. I think I've driven him crazy <laughs> since this report was released. Um, and he's been very generous with his time and his consideration of a public meeting, which he will be moving um, on our behalf. So I'm very grateful to Councillor Shiner and his, his ear. Uh, for years I've been talking about, close to eight years, uh, a moratorium in this area. I had many conversations with our chief planner, our former chief planner, Jennifer Kiesmat. Uh, I spoke about it at executive, at council. We are in desperate need of a catch-up in this area, a pause, a breath. Uh, it has been uh, unprecedented, the level of intensification in the young Eglinton area. And I've also spoke many times at Council is that there isn't a blade of grass uh, for people to enjoy or even for your pets to do their business, so pardon my language, but it's uh, becoming desperate. People are describing it as a massive construction site that was once one of the most desirable neighbourhoods in Toronto. Uh, people are describing it as they're choking on their way home and their way back because of the, the uh, dust and the concrete and the trucks parked all over sidewalks, which I also spoke about at licensing committee once. P trucks parked all over sidewalks, impacting pedestrians' access. Um, it's been a really unpleasant time for this neighbourhood. And uh, coupled with the, uh, the talk about the water pressure um, and the p lack of parks and green space and public realm, also, the big, the big elephant in the room is the young line, line one. And the issues on line one are capacity and reliability issues. And the, last week, I had a resident contact me and say they waited six trains in the morning to get down to Bay Street. Six trains. Then you get on, and I've talked about this multiple times at committee and at council, and you're like a sardine. And it's stop, start, stop, start, stop, start because of the ATC, the automatic, aut automated transit uh, control singling system uh, that was promised to me at a public meeting by Andy Byford in 2017. Uh, that clearly isn't going to happen and I understand there's now disruptions, further disruptions with getting the ATC in place. But it, you're lucky to get on. When you get on, you're, you're squashed and when you're on there, it's stop, start all the way downtown. Um, people are beyond fed up. So that's why in 2015 I moved a motion on infrastructure just because of these issues uh, along with the other things that have been cited including schools and community centres but simple things like water pressure. Uh, I'm very concerned about that one aspect let alone all the other major aspects around transit. So I've had a great opportunity to speak to some of the residents in the area they feel like there's a bit of a bullseye on their back. We heard that today. They want to know why there isn't better distribution. Um, I guess the thing that we'd really like to see happen, and I understand hopefully will happen if you as a, as a committee will endorse it, is another public meeting. Because we heard from people today that the upzoning that took place in the last few months was not something that uh, was people are really aware of. And um, as I said, there's people who are just learning of this uh, exercise in recent days. So a public meeting is very critical because there is still significant work to do on this report. 
We must address the parks. We must address the, the green space to make it livable. And as I said in my questions, uh, incrementally, we may see, say, see some green space and public realm, but if you look at the, the phased in approach and the need for the development to happen before the green space happens, we're still in this horrible um, interim space where we're not really dealing with the, the concrete and the lack of livability. Uh, and then lastly, of course, the heights are of great concern because of sunlight, shadow, and again, I will use the word livability. I can't use it enough. So I want to again wrap up by saying thank you very much to the uh, residents who came down. They have been, literally been here all day uh, to let people know what's happening in their neighbourhood. And I think this was a very valuable um, exercise today. So thank you to the committee for listening. Thank you. Uh, I have a number of motions now because we're coming into committee. So what I'd like to do is to place them up on the screen, allow them to be scrolled through. I'll give a brief description of what they are, and then if it's okay with the committee, I'll comment after uh, on it. So the first motion, which you can read, but there's a lot there. So there's a number of issues that have been identified by my colleagues, all three of them in the area, and by the public. And these are the questions that have come up, whether we would or wouldn't make changes and how we would do that. So the first one is dealing with some building heights. That's A. The second one is dealing with better employment opportunities, because there isn't a lot of employment opportunities we're adding employment in the area to this area that's growing a lot. The third one is to make sure that we are consistent with the growth plan. The fourth one is to add in building heights in meters so we actually know what a building might be uh, because there is a difference between a residential and a commercial, between all different ways that buildings are developed, so I think it's appropriate to have that. So recommendations on how we can implement recommendations one and three. Holding provisions, which was also a question that was here. And getting a range of mixed housing in the area which was an important issue with us. Yeah. So that is what motion number one is. Then, so that generally is putting forward what we are considering and trying to have that information out for, a, and I will show where we're gonna deal with it. The second meeting, the second motion that I have is finding ways, motion number two, to get more parkland in the area and work comprehensively on some sites that might be available. Motion number three is looking at ways to provide holding provisions in some of the areas. Looking at ways to provide holding provisions and amending some of the maps. And I'm placing these on behalf of my colleagues in the area as well, but staff are supportive of the motions as they go forward. And then the fourth one, I think, is very important, that there be a special public meeting for Midtown and focus the final report, this one here, be adjourned until July 5th. Together with motions two and three, no further notice be given. And the intention there is, and it's a little bit different than we've done in the past, we are going to go out and have another community consultation meeting. My colleagues are gonna to continue to discuss with staff some of the changes that they're looking at in height and or population. Staff will then come back and make sure that anything that might be recommended, if it's outside of what is in the growth plan, that we're notified of that. And then there will still be the opportunity for those of the public, if there is new information in front of us, to come and depute on that. So we're open to that and hearing from people. So we're not just taking it and either sending it to council with new recommendations there or making recommendations here. 
We're trying to be open to all those people that are here to deal with the issues. And then we'll be back on the 5th to deal with it. So those are the motions that I've placed. In speaking to the item, I, I think a tremendous amount of leadership has to be given to Toronto City Council. And I say that because the population has been growing for a long time, request was made, but on June 12, 2015, Council, in consideration of OPA 289, the Midtown Park Plan, directed the built form growth and infrastructure study, which is the origin of this plan. You know, we, we had a very senior staff member living in that area that was living through this mess and seeing the growth and wasn't bringing anything to us. Council had to act and get staff to move on this because the population in the area in 2006 was 51,000, 2011, 57, but by 2016, we have 62,000 people plus room for 19,000 more to move in. This place was blowing up and that's the complaints that we've heard today and in fairness to those that want to develop in the area, there was no real guidelines in place to say what we're looking for. And then the OMB stepped in on many, many of the applications and made decisions that I think from planning staff's perspective don't feel they were appropriate. And as it was said today, that bar kept getting lifted without a plan in place. Without a plan in place and no plan coming forward from planning staff at that time. It was council that enacted this to go forward. And it was a, it's a sincere disappointment, I think, to everyone that we're at the position that we're at without a plan in place. And that's the need that has been emphasized to us, to have a plan in place to give direction. I think the issue of um, the appropriate population um, and dealing with issues of transportation capacity, because we know the subway isn't able to do it. And handle what's coming out of that area. The crosstown isn't going to make it better. There's not employment being added to the area. So people are going to try and get on a subway line to go somewhere else. And yet we have a relief line coming up that's only stopping at Danforth, but has plans to go north. No, it should go continue to go north. You don't stop the shovel when you get to the Danforth. You use that as your first step and continue up to Eglinton and up to Shepherd Avenue to allow the relief that's needed so people can move on a proper transit system. We are losing office space and have continued to lose office or employment space there. Even the gentleman that was here is stuck with a site that he can't build what he'd like to to get more offices in there because it's residential. So we, and the parks plan is not sufficient. I look at the plan, I think everyone that does doesn't have to have all the good work that staff have tried to do with on-site, but show me where you're going to walk to, sit down, sit in a park, we don't have big spaces for that in the middle of these high density developments, and that might be a cost implication, well that's where council steps in to say we want to see it. If we can talk about Rail Deck Park downtown, then we can talk about a large park in this area too one of the densest areas in the city, 120,000 people living in this community, they deserve to have open and green space. And then as it was said today, when you walk down the street, you're now walking from an area where there hasn't been built up yet, north of Eglinton, into an area of shadow and cold, you can't see the sunlight and you feel uncomfortable. And I'll tell you an answer to the case, do I walk the area? Yeah, and my fastest walk is once I get down to Broadway and I just want to get down south of that area because even in, in the nicest weather, it's a terrible place and we've allowed that to happen. And we don't want to see that happen on Eglinton Avenue as well. We do want development, but we want something that's a livable, appropriate place to live. And I believe I am speaking not just at all for myself, but for my colleagues, both that represent the area, colleagues across the city that know the area and the public that's there. And I believe also for the development industry who doesn't want to build what some might call a ghetto when they don't plan that. They have a, a job that they feel to do, which is develop properties in a reasonable manner. And if we give them a plan, then they know what we like to see them do, and then they can carry it out. And then with all this in mind, I still believe that the way that this is going forward under Section 26 is the appropriate way. 
We are though trying to accommodate everything that people have said to make sure that we come back with any changes we have, that people can speak to us about that and we do proper consideration when we go forward with this at committee and then at council. So I really want to thank, you know, there's so many people that have been involved. The planning staff have been incredible. My colleagues have been incredible working together on this. I think we've gotten to a great point and I hope that on the 5th of July we can take this to the finish line and set it on to council and have a plan in place that everybody will be happy with. Quite, <laughs> I, I have a... The, the, committee, the committee meeting? The community meeting. I've come before, so if I can, I will come again. You have a, a question for the mover. I just, I, I, I wonder. Well, a non-member of the committee that I don't I, have I, to want, I wonder if I, I wonder if you know uh, the appreciation that I think all of us have for the really thoughtful way that you worked with all of us to arrive at a place that I think is going to be incredibly constructive, and I really appreciate that on behalf of the community. Thank you. Well, then I'll have to let you say that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So. M Madam Clerk, if there's no other questions of myself or anything, what do I do now? <laughs> Item, I vote on one? So we vote on one. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried unanimously. Now I vote on? Now I vote on, mo now I vote on motion four, which is to have this at the special public meeting. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. And now I'm deferring the other two motions until the next meeting, but our motions are public for everyone to see. And I really want to thank again everyone for doing this. We have gotten through. We have two more items. So please, I need quorum in the room. And those people that want to talk about this, please do us the favor of going outside so we can continue with the last two items. So the next item that we have. So, we have item eight. Sure, can I get people please, could I ask everybody please take, please take it outside. Sorry, I have to ask again, Councillor Matlow, Councillor Robinson, please. I'm not, I'm not building a house. I'm trying to run a meeting. Could I get staff as well? Mr. DeSorcy and others, could you take it outside? I really need to have the meeting go on. We are very short of time. We've done a great job getting to here, and I'd like to really get finished. So, we have two items left, the green standards, and we have before that the item on the shelters. There are some questions on the shelters of staff. Councillor DiCiano, did you wish to ask some questions? I did, thank you. Um, so just so I understand from reading the report, um, there are a series of issues that um, stand in the way of uh, finding uh, potential suitable sites for shelters. So this report is asking us to go out for public consultation with essentially two recommendations. Um, that is the 250 and the 80 meter uh, requirements. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Chair. At this point, uh, there are no recommendations related to those two items, the 250 meter separation distance and 80 meters back from a major street. The report speaks to options for both of those, different ways we could look at that. And that's part of going out with the consultation and getting that feedback. Right, so, the, so when the public consultations occur, um, you will be asking the public for their advice or their concerns on those two uh, 
issues. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, yes. Those two performance standards currently exist in the zoning bylaw. Right. So we'll be seeking input on that or varying them. Okay. So what about, because I, I noticed that out of the 311 potential sites, those amount to 10% of the sites that were problematic. So 90% of the sites that, that, that you looked at uh, failed to meet uh, the suitability of a shelter for reasons other than what you're going out to consult on. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, yeah, my calculation was around 12 or 13 percent, but that's generally correct. I would, just, I would just add to the Chair that that happened to be the bundle of sites they were looking at at that point in time. Right. So it's, it's more of a general reflection that we're looking at the performance standards in a way that doesn't frustrate future site selection options. <coughs> so there is not going to be any discussion in the public consultation meetings to revisit uh, let's say zoning for temporary zoning in uh, employment areas. Through you, Mr. Chair, no, the purpose of this report is quite specific. It relates to these two performance standards. Okay, so given that um, it's the, only these two performance standards um, and we have a crisis now uh, and we're not and 90 percent of the sites that may have potential we're not going to we're not going to try and solve the problems around those sites how does this help solve a crisis considering that it would come back next year when by next year if people don't have shelters for the winter time um, we're in a problem uh, through the chair municipal shelter staff are here and maybe want to comment on that i would just generally say that we've considered that uh, matter and in the context of sites that they're currently uh, looking to set up, uh, the zoning is not um, an immediate frustration. So we do have time to consider uh, implementing Council's goal uh, into 2019 and come back after we do the consultation with recommendations to uh, with recommendations on these two performance standards to put council in a position next year to choose the next or make decisions on the next tranche of sites uh, knowing that they have um, also considered whether or not council wants to uh, make the zoning more permissive and make that search a little more uh, uh, straightforward so do we not have a, a timing issue with respect to having to find sites now uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we have the sites we need for 2018. Okay. We are continuing to search for sites that we can open in 2019. Of course, we need to find those relatively quickly if we're going to open them in 2019. Um, we would welcome any latitude on, um, you know, on being able to find as of right zoning. But working with our colleagues in planning, we, we know this is a contentious issue. Um, and we see the benefit in doing a public consultation process to make sure that um, we have an opportunity to hear uh, what communities think. So I'm just confused how this report or this process helps you identify sites that you need to identify for 2019 this year when it's not going to come back to early 2019. Um, well, we'll continue to look for sites. It often takes us several months to complete the due diligence process. So if we identify sites that may be approved based on some latitude on these performance measures, we can continue to pursue them and hopefully early in 2019 be in a position to be able to close on those sites. So you would go out and look for sites based on certain performance standards that have not yet been approved by Council. Um, well, the process at the moment is that we don't pursue sites that don't meet these performance standards. I think if we found ourselves in the position that the site was good in every other way except for not meeting one of those performance standards, we would continue to do the due diligence process um, until such time as we were able to um, close on a deal if we were given that uh, opportunity based on the zoning requirements. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Perks, you have questions? Yes, um, nothing in this report slows down any of the work to find a shelter that we're currently undertaking. Is that correct? 
Well, again, I, I've asked a question, Justin, you asked yours. Just be a patient. You we're we're trying to work with shelters to uh, uh, identify, once sites have been identified for potential lease or acquisition, uh, identify any zoning constraints. And the, and the report gives some breakdown on so far what they've found and what those zoning constraints might be for some of them. Some of them are as of right. And we've identified that loosening up the zoning as a potential way to help find more shelter sites. So that's in part the motivation for this report. I, I understand. Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure that if we approve this report, we don't interfere with any of the current searches for shelters. I don't believe so, no. And, no. and we always have the option of committee of adjustment on a performance standard in the meantime if something came up. And, and my next question is if we are running out of places to put shelters, and I think that's a reasonable thing, and we do believe that part of the solution to that problem would be to uh, loosen some of the zoning and per performance standards requirements, uh, going out and doing consultation now makes making that change uh, easier in that we can demonstrate that we've done public consultation on it. Well, absolutely, and we wanted to, uh, much in the way that we've had other reports here even today on on uh, zoning parameters for different housing types, dwelling rooms, official plan policy. Our practice is to take it out and do a consultation so we can come back and have our advice to you after we've considered what the public has had to say about it. And if we didn't do that, uh, we would be vulnerable to people saying you never consulted on change? Never consulted or tried to rush it. Very good. So. On the one hand, this doesn't slow anything down, and on the other hand, this makes uh, expanding the number of potential shelter sites move more smoothly and more quickly. We believe so, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Campbell. Does this, uh, does this report, does it refer to permanent shelters or the sort of temporary accommodation, the, the respite uh, locations? It's, from a zoning point of view, it's a municipal shelter. So it's, that's the definition. Uh, it would capture the notion of, of respite and building officials here wants okay. to comment on that, but that's, we're, that's the definition that we're working with. So from a sheltering support and services standpoint, I know the mayor was talking about some of the definitional problems. People don't know what a respite is. There's temporary respite and so on. Um, what's the, the, the facility that's going in Ward 4, that's not really a shelter, that's a that's a respite, but what we used to, what we call a respite, is that correct? Uh, through the chair, uh, yes, councillor. There, we have in the last few years developed a different service model called respite. Um, it uh, often doesn't fall under the category of municipal um, shelter, although the sites that we're looking at for the temporary structures are um, approved for municipal um, shelter locations. Right. Okay. I can speak to you offline afterwards, but okay, thank you. So can I get into page four, just to understand the impact that we currently have with the restrictions that are in place. <coughs> Staff looked at 311 sites, that's right. Someone say yes or no. You met Mr. I, I, I am the chair, so I could answer myself through the chair, but I don't think that's a great thing to do. So we looked at 311 sites. Well, technically, it's the last sentence of that paragraph says 40 are ongoing, so it's actually 271 at this point. So we started with 311. Yes. And of the 311, the ones that are impacted by the zoning bylaw are the 27 sites that did not meet the location requirement or the seven sites that did not require there be no closer than 250 meters. So is it 34 sites that are impacted by this restriction? So there was 34 out of 311. Of the 34, and I had asked this when you were briefing me, but I didn't have an answer, how many of those actually could have turned out to be sites that we would have used because there are other criteria they have to meet? So of the 34, that the current restrictions uh, don't permit without a variance to those restrictions, how many of those were actually sites that you would have green-lighted? 
as the perfect site? Uh, through you, Chair, it was, it's difficult to say because that uh, the zoning requirements is one of the very first hurdles that we require a property to go through. So when it doesn't meet the zoning requirements, we don't pursue that property any further. But you went from 311 to 40 that you're going with. So, so the, uh, you're, the asking, you're asking that we amend or change a restriction that's in place when I don't know if it would have provided any assistance. I, I, I'm, you're giving me statistical numbers that don't give me a statistic that I know how I can use to say of the 34, there were four great sites, but we couldn't look at them. And if they were great, why isn't someone telling us that? that they were great. So Mr. Chair, all I can say is that uh, of the 311, we did not pursue 61 sites because of zoning uh, requirements that said a municipal shelter would not be possible. So because that's our first level of, of due diligence, we did not pursue those uh, sites any further. But of the other 250, you still only have 40 that you're going with. That's right. So, so how, how do I know from a statistical analysis with the information in front of me that any of those sites still would have been green lit and that changing of the restrictions would in any way assist in finding a shelter? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how I could answer that question, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, we can go back and look at those properties, although many of them are probably off the market. I think the next few months as we are looking at properties and continuing to look at them based on these performance measures perhaps not being in place, it will give us a better sense of, in general, how many properties we could continue to pursue if those restrictions were not in place. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions of staff? Councillor Bilo. So you were asked to look at what you could do without these two restrictions, correct? <coughs> That's why we have this report in front of us. Sorry, it, Ms. Yeah. through the chair, is that a question for shelters or for planning? Well, how about was anyone asked? Was anyone asked to do this, or how did this report get here? Yeah, there was there was a motion from Councillor Cressy. It was a, a, a request of planning to come forward with options for increasing as of right. Yeah. So why do we only have these two recommendations? And yeah, and how did you get here, given that out of the 300 and something properties, this only affects 27. I mean, should we be consulting on other recommendations that maybe need to be amended? To, to through, you, through you, Mr. Chair, the reason why it's only these two matters is because these are the only two performance standards that actually currently affect the shel municipal shelter definition. So municipal shelters are permitted in certain zones. Uh, they're actually permitted in most zones of the city, but they only have two performance standards applying to them. We're not proposing to look at where they're located in the city in terms of including them in zones where they're not permitted, but we, we thought bringing forward a review of the performance standards would work towards that motion of options to increase the potential to allow them in more places. It's only affecting the performance standards. And why didn't you look at anything else? Through you, Mr. Chair. The zoning that's applicable to the city on this site has recently been defended at the OMB. The OMB has confirmed the zoning permissions for which municipal shelters apply, and it's relatively fresh. We were not proposing at this time to open up the zoning in terms of <coughs> land uses. So, Councillor Demirmaker, were you telling me you wanted to speak on this item? I don't have any other questions of staff. Uh, member of the committee, go for it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to um, uh, speak briefly to the item as a councillor who had the first respite centre open in Scarborough. 
with uh, 49 beds. It would certainly have been, and as a willing host, I might add, uh, it's been a, an, an honor to be the host of that site. It's also been a learning curve. Uh, I think the as of right zoning permissions actually do help councillors because if it was up to a certain number of the people adjacent or in very close proximity to where we put our shelter, they would have objected every step of the way, they would have done everything possible to slow it down, and they would have put pressure on myself or any other councillor to say, you're our elected representative, we don't want this and you have to stop them. Some of us like to think that we have enough inner strength, moral fortitude to say, sorry folks, it's just not gonna happen, it's coming in. Uh, but there is a lot of pressure and there is a lot of hostility when, when the public thinks they can stop something for whatever reasons, and, and with shelters there are many, I'll say, unfounded fears. There are some well-founded concerns as well. Uh, so to bring something forward that would allow a sort of zoning as of right, not only helps our professional staff, not only helps us house people who need housing or, or at least in, in temporary shelters, but I do think it also helps the local city councillors explain to their residents that no, like for example in Scarborough, a group home is allowed to be located in this area, there's nothing we can do about it. And then usually people at the public meeting go, oh, well okay, what now can we do to make sure that the, the that facility doesn't impact you and the community negatively? So I, I'm very supportive of this. Uh, we're going to have very soon in my ward a 20,000 square foot men's shelter being built. I think it's starting this year, again, on, on a willing basis, and we're welcoming those folks in. Um, I think I'm getting one of the, uh, Councillor Campbell and I were out this earlier this week uh, looking at, I call them the bubbles, uh, but another 100 bed shelter uh, being built in my ward, which I know will be more of a challenge because it is uh, closer to a residential area, and we will work through that together. But again, uh, for me to walk into a meeting, uh, as this has been in the case in the past, to say, this is allowed, so I as your local councillor can't stop it. Even if you ask me to stop it, I can't do it. My job today is to make sure that you work with the local uh, church, the local um, staff, and to make sure everything's okay. And when we've had to have, again, men loitering, uh, in places that uh, the public thought were unacceptable, we've been able to change that. Uh, so we've done a lot of things, I'll call it on the qualitative side, to really listen to people, uh, but we need that proper zoning in place to facilitate things moving very quickly, uh, at the same time as listening to the community, but making sure that one or two residents uh, with some sometimes completely unfounded concerns can try to sabotage a project or slow it down uh, so that, if you will, we all go away. So I'm, I'm supportive of the recommendations. Um, we'll see who's back in, a, in these chairs in uh, early 2019 to look at the report. But I think there is a political will on our council to help those who are less fortunate. When I do get concerns by residents about why are you putting those people next to my children, I say, well, you know, there's 650,000 of us living in Scarborough, and some of our neighbours and some of our families and friends and brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers need these facilities. You can usually talk people down and you can usually get a, a consensus, but we need the backing of the correct zoning so that the amount of, of hardship and the amount of attack that we suffer as local councillors minimize. So I look forward to seeing this if I'm back in 2019. And again, I congratulate staff again in my ward for, for really taking care of my local residents. When they needed help, because there are impacts of shelters, when they needed help, our staff were there to help them. Thank you. And bring it into committee, Councillor Ticciano wished to speak. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Look, the way I look at it is we have a crisis now and um, we have to do everything we can looking uh, outside of the box as much as possible to fix the crisis. And I just don't think that this particular strategy gets us there uh, quickly. Um, you've got two small performance standards here. We don't even know if, if removing these performance standards would have, would have uh, got us any additional shelter space. Um, I was just hoping that we could uh, defer this till next 
uh, 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 session of planning and growth so that we can bring planning in for an offline meeting with perhaps <coughs> city legal to discuss what other performance standards we could put into a public consultation hearing so that we can really open this up. It, the, no, the notion that perhaps the crisis is only going to be this year and next, uh, I, have a, I have a funny feeling it's going to be a long-term crisis in the city and I don't think we're going to go through this whole public consultation process. We're going to give the planning department all this work and in the end, um, if it works, maybe, but what's the chances? Because right now it's only 90% 90, 90 of the sites that were looked at aren't going to be addressed by this. So um, I'm hoping that if people want to help defer this until next month so that we can have some off-site meetings and really maybe put a fulsome report together, um, that would be my, my, uh, 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 my, my uh, preference. Well, I can't vote on preferences. I can only vote on motions. If I could put a motion to defer to next month, uh, that would be uh, my motion, just so that we can have a f make this make this this process more meaningful than I think it is right now, because there is a crisis. And and look, the first time I, I was asked by 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 staff to to bring a shelter in my area, I said absolutely. It was a 10 second conversation over the phone. I said for sure. It never happened because our process here at the city. Uh, made it so that we move at a snail's pace and the market moves at the market pace. Now I'm trying to get a shelter, a big shelter, uh, brought into my area again. And even if this report were approved today and implemented with bylaws tomorrow, it still couldn't happen. So none of this is, is solving a crisis that we all want to help solve. So that's how I see it, uh, Mr. Chair. Well, there's a motion to defer, and Councillor Perks would like to speak. Thank you. I'd like to urge my colleagues to vote against Councillor DiCiano's motion to defer. Uh, anytime you hear an argument that in order to move faster, we have to slow down, check, check your wallet. The, the fact of the matter is there are obstacles to placing shelters now. And within those obstacles, we're doing what we can. This or helps not. us to remove an obstacle. If Councillor DiCiano has ideas for other obstacles to remove, here's the advice I would give him. It's the same advice I would give anyone in the City of Toronto. Participate in the consultation and make recommendations to staff at that point. But to, to, to simply say, well, you know, I don't think this solves the whole problem right now, so let's, let's slow down and maybe, you know, put it off for a while, that's not helpful. It's absolutely the opposite of helpful. This item has been in front of the Community Development and Recreation Department uh, Committee six times in the last two years. And the opportunity to contribute positive solutions and, and suggestions and open doors and find new ways of doing things has been there for every member of council. This item has been in front of council several times this term. If, if if any member of council has a better idea, where have they been hiding it for the last two years? There is no better idea that's been brought forward that I'm aware of. So I urge the staff to continue the, the difficult but important work they've been doing in finding locations where it's possible. I congratulate the planning staff on bringing forward uh, a process for maybe easing some of the restrictions so we can do even better. And I encourage anyone who thinks they have a better idea to actually bring it forward instead of getting in the way of people who are trying to help. <coughs> no other speakers. We have a motion to defer. All those in favor of the deferral. All those opposed. The deferral loses. We have the recommendation from staff. So we have recommendation one. So I have a blank screen. Sorry, it's just under the recommendation. Oh. Recommendation one is conduct citywide public planning and growth management committee direct the chief planner, executive director of city planning to conduct citywide public consultations on the proposed options to increase the as of right zoning permission for municipal shelters. So it's the consultation part. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried.
The second part is the Planning Growth Management Committee requests the Chief Planner Executive Director City Planning to prepare a final recommendation report with the Zoning Bylaw <coughs> Amendment and not fall over during it uh, for shelters in early 2012. All those in favor? Opposed? That doesn't carry. So we will go out for the consultation. What do you mean? We will go out for the consultation. What, what do you mean it didn't pass? What do you mean? We aren't bringing. One, two, three. Campbell, Beach Campbell, and Shelby. Yeah. No. With a zoning bylaw amendment prior to consultation. That's what it is. That's right. Right here. So, the next item we have is PG 30.9, Toronto Green Standard Version 3, Review of Potential Incentives and Results of Additional Consultations. We have speakers on that, which I think have been waiting here. We have Michael Messer from FLAP. Is Michael still here? Is Stephen Warren still here? And Paul Grolu? So, Michael, you have the pleasure of speaking for everyone. Yes. Uh, thank you, everyone, for this opportunity. You have, I'm sure thank you're here for a while, you have five minutes? Yes. Um, hopefully, I'll be less than five. Um, uh, first, I want to say uh, thank you uh, for the City of Toronto uh, and City staff for being the first city in the world to introduce preventative development guidelines and standards. Uh, whether you understand this or not, there are cities from across North America that are following Toronto's lead. Uh, Toronto continues to lead the way in this particular issue of bird building collisions. And I'm hopeful that I might be able to impress upon you now that with some slight improvements, uh, you'll be producing the best standard possible. Uh, one of our concerns, and if you wish, uh, on the back screen there, there's uh, imageries here that I'm going to hopefully help, um, help you understand better what's going on. One of the uh, revisions to the existing standard points to uh, first surface applications of bird deterrent markers. Uh, being set for 2022, uh, I want to impress upon you the importance of first surface uh, applications uh, because what happens with first surface applications, if you look at, a, at your standard window of transparent glass, under certain daylight conditions, you can see straight through that glass to interior spaces. But as the daylight shifts, as that daylight is more intense, that transparent glass becomes a mirror. And this is part of the problem with bird collisions with structures is birds see the reflective qualities of glass as the real thing. So it's so important to have first surface applications. And if you look closely at the image on the left, this is the Markham Pan Am Center. It has frick patterns on that glass specifically designed for bird deterrence. They follow Toronto's lead in bird-friendly deterrence, bird-friendly guidelines. But if you look at the top row of glass, those bird deterrent markers disappear. And again, it's because of available daylight being present or not, the, the presence of those markers disappear, and, and hence why it's so important to have first surface application. If we look here in the city of Toronto, uh, 20 Wellington Street East, this is a, a recently uh, retrofitted building with mirror glazing, uh, which has adopted the standard. What you can't see with all this reflection is in fact behind that glass, second surface, is a frit pattern. It doesn't matter what time of day you're looking at that glass, you cannot see the deterrence on that glass. So it's so important for bird's sake, it is so important to have first surface be a part of your revised standard, hopefully before 2002. I'm going to give you examples of some uh, bird deterrent uh, fabricators out there. Uh, there's different techniques presently being produced, specifically products designed to reduce bird collisions with buildings. There are ceramic, uh, digital ceramic printing on glass, there is window film treatments, there are silk screen ceramic printing on glass, and then there's acid etch etching on glass. These products, again, have been, des been designed specifically to reduce the issue of bird collisions for new and existing construction. These products are available on the landscape now, um, and hence why it's so important, as this technology is already available, you consider having this, uh, instead of being pushed to 2022, have it be uh, as soon as possible, if not with your existing standard as is. Uh, there were two gentlemen that were going to be following me. Unfortunately, they did have to leave uh, from two different companies that produce this very product. Um, I wish they were here to be able to speak more directly on their, on their product, but the, the bottom line is this product is available, 
And I, I would hope that this would give you some confidence to perhaps instead of wait till 2022, again, have it uh, uh, come sooner. And that is basically my, my request to you to consider. Um, if there are any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. Are there any questions? Councilor De Beermaker. Thank you, through you, Mr. Uh, uh, Chair. So you're, you're actually very happy with what the City of Toronto has done in terms of trying to prevent bird collisions and deaths in the City of Toronto? Oh, certainly. Outstanding. Your request is that the standard that we adopted that takes effect in January 1st, 2022 should be January 1st, 2020. Correct. And can you tell me roughly, if you're, by your estimate or knowledge, how many migratory birds, hummingbirds, all sorts of birds, how many species come through and how many million are killed a year in the city? Right. Just through colliding into our windows? Right. So uh, there are well over 250 species of birds that migrate through the Toronto region each spring and fall. Uh, if we take the estimate of one to 10 birds colliding with each structure with glass on an annual basis and look at the total number of uh, structures in Toronto that has glass, and uh, from what I understand there's well over 900,000 structures, there's an estimated close to a million birds dying for the City of Toronto alone. And, and you think, again, in the city staff, think it's a simple fix. You put the uh, markers on the outside of the glass and you reduce fatalities by what percentage, roughly? That number, unfortunately, we can't, I can't provide you with. Uh, I can say for sure, based on retrofits that have been done with uh, existing buildings, that we've seen uh, uh, where they've applied markers on the first surface, we've seen a reduction of close to 90%. Okay. And, and how long have you been in the bird saving business, I'll call it? Uh, 30 years. And have you had, uh, with the Toronto Green Standard, have you had any objections from developers, architects, glass manufacturers to say, we don't want the standard or the standard causes any type of hardship to, to anybody? Right. Uh, no, in fact, the exact opposite. When we get contacted by developers and architects, it's more about helping them meet Toronto's standard. Um, and among the top of the list of frustrations from architects and developers has been concerns around second surface, learning that it may not be an effective deterrent as a result of it being on second surface. So, and, and this is, as I showed in one of the images, uh, uh, is an example of a, a site with second surface frame. So, again, you think using the current guidelines, because we haven't implemented the new guideline yet, Correct. that people actually follow the law, they follow the bylaw, they, they're good citizens, what they find out is what we've told them to do isn't as effective as it should be, and then they have to call you because they're still having dozens of birds and hummingbirds killed, in well, they, the mornings when people come to work. They, they call based on, they're trying to meet the expectations of their client, namely the developers, uh, and uh, um, when they learn that their markers can be hidden by the reflection, they're going, what was the point of us applying these markers in the first place, right? So th that's namely the, uh, the concern that's expressed. And finally, through you, Mr. Chair, I think you and I both sit on the Canadian Standards Association Technical Working Group on, on Bird Council Friendly. Councillor DeBearmaker, we're way over the time. Okay. I don't think I started at zero. I started at three and a half minutes. Uh, can we wrap it up? Because there are things I, you I know. I just said my final question. Okay. Maybe you didn't hear me. Okay. I said through you, Mr. Thank Chair, you. my final question. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, my final question. You sit on the Technical uh, Advisory Group. Uh, do you think there will be a national standard that will have the outside um, glazing proposed? Have attended one meeting. That it would help if we pushed up our implementation right. date? From what I understand uh, from the, the people that are part of the committee, they're all speaking first surface. They all seem to be quite comfortable and prepared to move forward with the first surface application, but it's still at, at the infant stages of this committee. There's a lot of discussions that still have to take place, but so far so good. They all seem to be on side with first surface. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So, no one else has any questions of the deputant? Now, um, there are questions of staff. <coughs> Who here is knowledgeable on this? Because <laughs> it's always answered through the chair, and I don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> Who can answer? What I, what I wanted to know is, we're proposing to bring this in for 2022, and my colleague would like to bring it in for 2020. So my question is, why did you recommend 2022, and what are the impacts and or are those in the industry with buildings being planned or under 
construction or otherwise able to bring these standards in for 2020? And if we move it to 2020, what will the impact of that be? How's that for all the questions at once? I'll, through the chair, I'll, I'll start, and I, my colleagues here who are expert in this um, perhaps can assist. Um, the, the Toronto Green Centre has a history of sort of uh, every four years sort of upping the ante in terms of uh, sustainable performance measures for new development and has a, sort of a very, very positive working relationship with the industry in terms of building that capacity and changing the way people construct buildings. In terms of the work on the bird-friendly glazing, um, my colleagues Kelly Snow and Shana Stott are very much involved as um, co-chairs on the Canadian Standards Association Committee right now working on um, the, um, the, the bird-friendly designed um, guidelines. And one, of the, one component of that is to look at, um, I think, the manufacturing process and what changes may be required from the manufacturing process to enable glass manufacturers to, um, uh, I guess, build their capacity and get on board to deliver first surface um, glass, as well as deal with what I understand are issues with respect to warranty. That work will be reported out on, it's expected in the spring of 2019, and should the outcome of that work be that, that the industry is much more further along than perhaps we had understood or anticipated, we would be more than happy to bring something forward sooner in terms of recommending that the standard be changed earlier than January 1st, 2022. At this point, we just don't know what the outcome is. and if, with your indulgence, I'll just allow my colleagues perhaps to clarify a little bit on the technical aspects of that. There we go, through the chair. The CSA process is a fairly rigorous process and it will be looking at all the uh, re technical issues associated with first service. There are some uh, manufacturers currently that are producing these products. Um, but we're looking at, uh, when we set a requirement, it will require a scaling up of, of the production of those, uh, those types of products to meet the demands of the industry. For any requirement that would come in, it would start with the, uh, the application date. So if a requirement was established at 2020 or 2022, that would apply to new buildings that are coming in for site plan approval as of that date. So it would allow them time to you know, spec the correct materials and uh, work with their suppliers um, starting with the, the uh, at that point in the design process. Um, so as, as uh, Sharon else um, mentioned, we are you know, waiting for the outcome of that CSA process. So then, if we wanted to advance it, and you are going out to look whether CSA and the glass manufacturer can be there, instead of changing the date today, could we ask you to come back early next year to see if we can change the date and then deal with it after you get a little more information, which would allow us to accept your recommendation for today, but I think accomplish what our deputant and my colleague would like to do instead of just picking a date without that? I see a shaking of heads, but I don't hear anything. Sorry, through the chair, yes, that's very reasonable. Thank you very much. So I don't hear any other questions of staff. I'd be more than happy to move a motion uh, to that effect. Uh, and the motion would be to, what's my motion? I think to report back on the uh, results of the, the CSA um, uh, review process for the voluntary standard for bird-friendly design in the second quarter of 2019. Twenty nineteen. Yes, in addition to us here. So yes, if, if that's what it is. So in other words, it's a further report back in the second quarter of twenty nineteen on the CSA review. And at that time, if we can advance it, we'll advance it. And it doesn't in any way slow down the opportunity to advance it. That's the amendment. Can we vote on the amendment? Do you have to hear it? Do you have to speak to it, Council? We're all in favor of you? We either want to go, man, and, and, and we want to go. Well, okay. We got the amendment. The amendment is to get a report back early 2019 on CSA's approval of it. On the amendment, all those in favor? 
You, you can't, but I appreciate it. Any opposed? Not seeing that. On the item as amended, all those in favor? Any opposed? <coughs> I can do this with pleasure. Meeting is adjourned. Go out and vote. We'll keep